I never personally saw any sexism. So I did see racism, uh, not to a great level, but I did see racism. Um, I saw obviously a massive amount of unprofessional behavior over the years. I was in internal affairs for five years, so that's all I ever dealt with. But what you don't get is the petrol bombs would go above our heads. So we'd be, we'd be in a line with long shields. So we'd have long shields, we'd have helmet on, we'd have our flame retardants on. And what they would do is they would throw the petrol bombs at the walls behind us. So the flames would come down on top of us. So the liquid <laughs> flames would come down on top of us. So I thought, so right, so creep up, creep up, creep up, get faster, faster, faster. I try and do the door, I miss the door. It goes through the glass plate window. <laughs> Obviously, with my hand the other side, I don't drop the enforcer. I've got all the guys <laughs> fucking into me. Obviously, straight away, I'm thinking, oh my fucking word, they're gonna take the piss now. I'm not worried about anything else. Drugs getting pushed down the loo or anything else. Welcome to the Everyday Perspective. Today we're talking life in the Met Police with John Kennedy. John is a retired DCI, Detective Chief Inspector, after 30 years in the service. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, mate. Yeah, look forward to it. So 30 years, that's a long old time to spend. That's as old as Danny, basically. Um, yeah. What year did you join? So I joined in 89. I did retire slightly early. Uh, I retired in uh, 2017, 2018. Okay. Um, but... Yeah, it was a very long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but 30 years, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about it as, as, we, as we go on as the interview progresses, I enjoyed every single minute of it. Um, don't regret any of it, but obviously, um, yeah, we're going to hear some of the stories today, but obviously some consequences to obviously some of the things that I did, some of the things that I experienced. I had some good times, some bad times, some indifferent times, but um, I don't regret any of it. Yeah, okay, so good. good. So, as you say, we, we, we're going to chat about loads. So, we want to hear about your funniest, your scariest, oh, your most daring moments, I've which we'll few. get to. Got a few. Um, obviously, DCI is a relatively senior rank as well. So, it'd be good to, to understand your journey to that position and, and maybe see if there's any advice to people that are joining the force yeah, now. of course. Or aspiring to get into that senior position. Um, I guess the elephant in the room at the moment is, is the recent Casey report on the old Met. Um, and an interesting one of the findings were that officers were 82% white and 71% male. So you're very, very fitting of, of that. <laughs> yeah. And, and obviously when I joined, it was a lot higher. Yeah, I bet. So, so I hear the Met love an, an initiation. They do. So 30 years ago, what was your initiation? So 30 years ago, um, I don't even know whether you boys will remember it, but obviously London was getting bombed by the IRA. So obviously a lot of suspect packages used to be left in various places. And and actually, uh, the Met did lose a few officers. So any suspect package was treated really, really seriously. But of course, if you're a new lad from Plymouth, don't really know the history of London, don't really know the history of the IRA, obviously, you believe anything that you're told. So one day, we had a suspect package um, in a particular part of Oxbridge, which was my first police station. So my shoulder number was 276, a 276 X-ray uniform. Can you go to Cowley Street suspect package? Now, the way that we were trained was, obviously, if it's a suspect package, make sure nobody's nearby, uh, check the package, so on and so forth, and you always call your sergeant down to, obviously, um, have a look and, and obviously make a final decision. So, of course, I saw the suspect package. There was nobody around too much. So I called the skipper down. The sergeant came down. Oh, my God, John, um, I think it's radioactive. So he said, have you touched it? I went, yeah, yeah, I got near it. He said, nah. He said, sorry, son. He says it's radioactive. He said, we're going to have to call an ambulance. So, of course, obviously, back then we worked really close. Your ass fell out, yeah. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so I thought, no children now, Johnny boy. That's it. No children for you, son. Anyway. Is that, that where your hair went, just to clarify? Oh, no, my hair went long before okay, that. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's already bored at this point. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that didn't last long, did it? Eh? Um, so, obviously, back then... Um, the NHS and the police worked massively together. We just socialised together. A lot of cops married nurses. And, um, you know, there was a, a real great kind of understanding. I don't know why that's disappeared now. But but back in my day, um, we really worked closely together. So, of course, obviously, the nurses and the doctors were on board the wind-up. So, anyway, um, so the NHS, uh, sorry, the ambulance came down. Yeah, yeah, sorry, son. We're going to have to take you back to the hospital and, and scrub you down. So, of course, <laughs> like, I didn't think 
they're thinking of it. So obviously, go in the ambulance, right? And they're telling about radioactive and uh, radiation and, and, and obviously what radiation can do. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm only 21. <laughs> like, oh. So um, we get there and then um, I'm shown into this room, the other side of a and this is Hillingdon Hospital for those that know London at all, which is in Uxbridge. Um, so I get in there and then the nurses go, sorry, we've got to scrub you down. We've got to scrub you down with chemicals. You need to take all your clothes off. So of course, didn't even bat an eyelid. So obviously I stripped off and then all these nurses bollock came it. out. Yeah, bollock naked. Bollock yeah, it, yeah, yeah, bollock naked. All these nurses came out, scrubbed me down. <laughs> Did you get a bit and- of blood in them? Yeah, Before, um, yeah. Oh, honestly, no. <laughs> no, I was a little bit on the worried side, Danny, at yeah, the time. Right. And then next thing, my whole relief just burst in on me, obviously laughing the socks off, and obviously you realise then bastards have got Do you me. Know, that's a fucking long way to go, isn't it? For yeah. A joke. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah honestly, but that's, that's what it was like. That was what it was like. And the irony of the situation is one of my mates, who funny enough was a field gun crew down here from Plymouth, he ended up marrying the nurse that scrubbed him down, obviously. Big, big lad, big yeah. lump, and he ended up. She, she, she was a nurse. Left the nurse, joined the police. But, but at that stage, obviously, like what she saw, ended up having a date, and they ended up marrying. But so that made you feel uh, bullied and humiliated, mate. Not really. No, no, no I did. I did find it humiliation. No, I did. I, I, you know, back then, you know, it was just a wind up. It was just yeah. a joke. That's how yeah. I saw it. You know, it was a bit of a laugh. You know, well done, John. You took it really well. Mm. That was it. Never better than I did. Yeah. Did you did you ever see it go a bit south? So sort of these sort of things on other yeah. people that didn't yeah. Go quite so of as... course everyone is different, aren't they? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, um, you know, back I, back in the day, I hate using the phrase, but but back in the when I when I joined, yeah, some things did go a little bit far. But but I tell you one thing, um, and I really really mean this. And I've got four daughters. I was head of safeguarding, so you know, I've dealt with all types of safeguarding offences I never saw um I never personally saw any sexism so I did see racism uh, not to a great level but I did see racism um I saw obviously a massive amount of unprofessional behavior over the years of, I was in internal affairs for five years so that's all I ever dealt with um but I didn't see a lot of sexism where women were treated massively different but then again I, I guess unless you are that person then maybe yeah. because obviously the I'm a bloke. Obviously, I didn't see it, but I, but I didn't see a lot of sexism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to to mention obviously the Casey report that came out. I think this month. Yeah. Um, and obviously there was, yeah, the institutional racism, homophobia, misogyny was identified. Yeah. That's what um, I was say. Misogyny is probably a you know a big thing in there. Yeah. But again, it's one of those misogyny goes back, doesn't it? A long way. But, so like in that but, sort of like boys but the club. The only thing shit. I say about misogyny, right? You got and teaching, NHS. Fire brigade, armed forces, gym. You know, we all work yeah. in gyms. You know what I mean? It is part of normal life. Why should the police? I'm not, I'm not defending it, by the way, but, but I'm trying to give a bit of perspective here. Why should the police be treated any differently? You know, this is a large organisation. Right? Any large organisation, people are going to have affairs, aren't they? People are going to have affairs. It's 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 human life, isn't it? Mm. So so I, I don't buy into that. Yeah. I'm not saying. Listen, it goes on. Of course, it goes on. But is it the end of the world? That, that well, it just depends, doesn't it? Whether it's it's the the woman that's happening to mm. that's that's the honest truth, and how far it goes. Because a little bit of like misogyny or or sexism, a little bit, you know, it probably happens. Steady, steady. <laughs> <laughs> probably happens in loads of workplaces. Yeah, of course but it does. then again, it's with the police. Aren't you supposed to be like setting a better example? Does that make sense? I think. I think. But the thing that the thing with the term misogyny is about hatred towards women, right? So I think it's easy to use that term loosely. So, yeah. did you see hatred towards women nope. and discrimination in, in the police? Nope. Um, and I some, imagine it's just sexualization. I'm not saying it didn't go yeah. on, by the it's way. It's more like was. sexualization of women. I imagine that's what happened. Like, if you had a, if you had a fit, fit, fit burden that you work with, she probably got a lot of fucking stick Yeah, for it. well, that was one of the other comments as well. It was it was predatory behavior and unacceptable behavior. So, you pair that with a bit of misogyny, and that's what you, I guess, you yeah, get a sexual I, harassment. But I agree with John, though. It's not it's not predatory, is it? A lot of blokes are we're, we're built that way a little bit just to be dicks. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm a dick to my, my wife all the time. In a good way, we fuck around, we have good fun. Like, again, there's 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 different ways to do it, isn't there? There's that creepy, fucking weird way that you see some yeah. blokes alike, and then mm. there's a bit of a bit of a joke and a bit of yeah. bit of fun, and 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 then there's where where the, where the line is, isn't there? Yeah, there is. There is. I, I'm listen. I'm not saying it, it, it's going on, but but again, the character that I was myself, right? People knew where I stood. 
All right. So, so as I went through my career, you know, professional standards was really, really important to me. Professionalism was really, really important to me. So obviously I would work in a department or I'd work at a police station. I, I would not expect any unprofessional behavior. So I think the people around me or the people that I socialized with, they would never do that because if they did, one, I wouldn't be happy about it. And two, you know, you guys have known me long enough. You know, I'm the type of guy, if I see something wrong, I deal with it at the time. I'm not one to like, oh, let me have a think about that. Oh, I'll, I'll sort it out tomorrow. I'll sort it out next week. If I see something that's wrong, I deal with it. And, and in the police, obviously, that's what I did. And I, I did do it. You know, I used to go out on do's and social do's and see behavior that wasn't great. But I would deal with it there and then. You know what I mean? So, so uh, you know, after a while, my kind of reputation for that kind of went before me. So the people that worked for me or people that worked with me knew that if they crossed the line, JK was not going to be happy. I think the big you know? thing as well and, and that's, is... And that's how it was. It's we're not... Well, not we, but the, the police, that they're humans. They're not robots. You know, you're going to have massive different types of personalities from all different backgrounds, all different... You know, all different things. They, they're not they're not robots. And I think nowadays, we're all expected to be fucking robots. You know, we're supposed to not have any any urges, any, you know, kind of fun. You know, what I find funny, you find funny, you find funny is probably wrong these days in, in a fucking open context of things. You know, all these different types of things. And it's going to a point now where they're going back and they're going, you know what, you were all fuckers. You're all bastards, all wrong. Not forgetting all the fucking good the police have done, protecting people and probably like eight ways or a bit of fucking this and that for years. But then they'll go and say, nah, you were all scumbags really. Basically, it's what it seems like to me. Yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah. Just That's the thing, isn't it? Because it's the, the, the common institutional that suggests that it's, you know, weaved into every aspect of it and it's not yeah. individual. So what's your reaction to that? So so I disagree with that. Okay. So, so the problem with the case report is that um, the report is all about wrongdoings within the Met. Listen, the Met needs to be shaken up a little bit. It needs to be sorted. Of course it does. But the, but the problem with any report is you're only listening to people that have got complaints, only got people that have got issues, right, which is fair enough and they need to be resolved. But what the report doesn't look in is, is the thousands and tens of thousands of good things that cops do every day. Never once, you know. So so the good things massively outweigh the bad things. Um, and you've got Wayne Cousins, you know. Um, and I know there's a few bad apples in the Met. Of course there is. But, but one individual who has caused um, the reputation of the Met to sink so low... I struggle to get my head around that because the majority of cops do do a good job. They do, 100%. I've seen it all my life and, and I still see it today. Of course, there's some bad apples that need to be sorted out. But you're right, Paul, to say institutional, I struggle with that because the good things always outweigh the bad things. Yes, we've got to sort out the bad things. Of course we have. Um, and um, I, I remember after Wayne Cousins, right? I, um, so my oldest daughter is a teacher in London and I remember phoning her up, and don't forget, they've been raised by me, so they, they know how police work, and they've seen my friends and my mates and my socials. They, you know, they've heard me do sorting out jobs on the phone in the back of a car. Um, but I remember phoning up um, my oldest daughter and saying, "Look, don't ever get stopped by a unmarked police officer." All right. Now I've been a detective most of my life. I've never once in my career have ever stopped a, a female by myself. I've always had a female officer with me or I've had an arrest team in uniform, okay? So, and I remember phoning her and saying that, Nick, whatever you do, if, if, if someone, if, 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 a, if a, uh, an unmarked, a plainclothes police officer stops you, don't stop for them, right? But it was a real mind fuck mm. because obviously I'm very proud of the police. Uh, I'm very proud to have been a cop, but to tell your daughter that, and it could well be a genuine instance, but the police have got to learn, obviously, to go forward. But, but, but telling my daughter not to stop for a plain close police officer was a real mind melt. But then that could be because you know that really a, a, police, a police officer who's not in uniform yeah. shouldn't be stopping a woman on that. Hundred percent. So you know that if yeah. they're doing that, they're yeah. doing something. Wrong. But 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 in the you know but but you know in the day um, there might well be an instance you know whether you, you might have multiple suspects or multiple jobs going on or something happens there might well be a genuine case where you, you end up being by yourself and you see something so I'm talking about from a police perspective and if you see something that is wrong you shouldn't be thinking oh my god I shouldn't stop that person because of what 
you have to react. You know, if a crime has taken place or somebody needs help, you should be having 100% confidence in the job and the community to sort that out rather than think, oh my God, if I stop that, oh my God, someone could think that I'm a pervert or mm -hmm. uh, or something else. You know what I mean? So, so you're right, Danny, but also there may well be circumstances where you are on your own and you need to sort out a particular crime or you need to help a particular victim, but there shouldn't be a stigma behind it. There's enough pressure on cops as it is without having to think, oh my God, do I have to wait for backup or, 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 or you know, whatever. You, yeah, but that's, that, I'm not just saying, that's the world we live in. Now, yeah, of course. Yeah, 100%. Mental, yeah, 100%. It, you know? it's, 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 it's nuts. Yeah, I've, it's, I've got a friend who's just joined the uh, local police force as a PC, and I spoke to him recently, and he said the exact same thing. So he, he joined the police force. It was one of these things that he, he wanted to change careers. It wasn't entirely yeah. sure what he wanted to do. He wanted to give the police a crack to see what it was like. Um, and he said to me, he said, it's just impossible. He said, because he, he said, like, this, this woke culture we live in, he said, it's really hard to define woke, but yeah, it's, it's fucking everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. And he said, when, when you're in meetings, when you're in training, like, the, you're constantly being, oh, you can't say that. Oh, you can't say that. And he's like, how the fuck are you supposed to go out in the community and deal with real life problems, exactly to your point, worrying yeah. about offending people or, or yeah. saying the wrong thing? He said, there's enough shit to worry about being a copper. And as a result, he's like, I'm, I'm out. He, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's out, he's bailing. I went through the whole process, did I, recently? Did you? Yeah, I went through the whole process, went to my final interview and then decided not to do it. Yeah. Just partly because of that, really. We, yeah. we, me and me and Kersi sat down and spoke about it's it. It's a shame, like, mate. That's a real shame. Yeah, but it's just what we're talking about now. It's like you're getting into it at a point where would you actually want to be a copper now? I wouldn't. That's the honest truth. Hundred percent. That's the honest truth. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah, yeah. want to put myself in that situation because I know I'm outspoken. I know. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no I, shit. Yeah. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Right, I know, I know right, if I'm right. outspoken. I know, like, I know if I was in situations where I thought something was right, and they, even though they said, you know, it's not politically correct or it's not the, you know, what they don't think, think is the right thing, I would probably have still done it. And you can get yourself in hot water yeah. for the money. It's just, it's just fucking not worth it, in my opinion. Now to be a copper, unless you, you're starting from twenty one. And you, you know, straight in, go like university and go and maybe as, you know, go yeah, the yeah, ladder yeah. and all that sort of stuff, maybe. But for a bloke like me now, I can, I could probably earn just as much working in fucking Liddles. When yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the pay, I mean, the pay is good as you go on. I mean, I as mean, you go on, yeah. You obviously yeah, start seven years. really low. Yeah, I mean, it is decent. I, I, I do out. think they, they don't, get as much as they should do. You know, whether they get pay rise this year, I don't know. But the pay is 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 decent once you've done a few years, especially when you get promoted. It, it takes seven years to get to 42,000 in there. It's not bad, Dan, is it? After seven years, you know, 42 is... It depends, what, it depends what age you're joining, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, say, I, yeah. I, I get that. So for me, I, for me to get back to where I am now would take yeah. seven years. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Roughly. And yeah. it's like, fuck me, do I really want to do that? But anyway, that's... that's but just, just on that, guys, the interesting thing is when I retired in... Um, 2017, 2018, over half the senior officers at ACPO, so these are commanders and above, three quarters of the Met ACPO were women. And Chris Dick was a commissioner. Mm. All right. So um, I, it's funny, I remember having conversations with blokes and thinking, oh my God, you know, when are we ever going to get promoted? Because obviously... Uh, were they actively of, promoting women then? Well, they, they, we, we had, we had, we had, we had you know, job. we had, you know, the ceiling and we had, you know, uh, the glass ceiling and all this kind of stuff. Like, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't want to get into, do certain women deserve to be promoted? It's not about that. I just think um, the best person for the job. Well, I'll that's right. I mean, but that's that. what it should be full stop. Yeah, right, that's it. Yeah. It doesn't matter about your sex, orientation, your colour. I've always, I've always... Yeah, best person for the job. Best person for the job. But but I do get, you've also Got to be representative of the community that you work, and obviously the Met struggle uh, to, to reach that. And I get that, but what, what I'm kind of talking about is that so five six years ago, half the most senior leaders in the Met, over half were women. So when we talk about all these things, you know, what for me, what were they doing? You know, what were they doing to support women in the job? Uh, support women going through bits and pieces when 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 you know these are the policy makers these are the these are the senior leaders that that direct strategy uh, amongst the workplace you know what i mean and when you've got a, a system where where, where, where more than 50% of the senior leaders are women i find it astonishing that women still struggle within the met police and, and i'm sure they do and i'm sure there's loads of idiots that need to be sorted out but when but, but when most of the senior leaders are women i'm thinking what are they doing you know, where's the support for the women underneath them, you know, or the women um, officers on, on the streets? I don't, I don't get it. They're bringing out a lot of new programmes, so to support women now, I think, within the Met. Yeah, there is. Of course there is, and, and rightly so. Um, but but I, I still find it's like Mark Crowley, who's the commissioner of the, of the Met Police now. He was in the Met Police um, seven or eight years ago where, um, you know, the two main protagonists that we're talking about, you know, the, the guy that committed multiple rapes and the guy that... 
killed Sir Everard, um, they were both under his command. They are both under his command. And yet, yet he was a senior leader at the time. It's a hard one, though, isn't it? Because for him, he... he, 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 he don't, <laughs> You wouldn't, you wouldn't know that. I know they had a bit of a history, though, didn't they? Each, each of them had a bit of a history of like things that led yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, and I do get obviously he, he, he's the top boss, as it were. So, so obviously, you know, even as a DCI store acting superintendent, you know, it was very hard to know all the staff under you or that work for you. I mean, some, when I was acting superintendent, you know, I sometimes had three, four hundred cops. Um, and I remember going to a wedding a few years ago with with, with my wife, and um, it was one of my mates that had got married, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd had people come up to me. Going, you right, Gov? You right, boss? I can't even remember them, you know, because obviously, I, you know, you are, you, you do get, you, so you don't know everybody. But, but the, of course, there should always be systems in place when when you're in charge of a command. There should be systems in place to weed out the bad cops. Hundred percent. I would go on commands, right? Seriously, I remember going to uh, Heathrow as uh, in charge of the crime squad, right? And and you do get to know everybody w- within a particular area of field. And within three or four days, I had transfer requests on my desk from two or three of the guys because they, they didn't want to work with me because they knew what I meant and what I represented. And um, within two or three days, they'd gone. Have you got anyone in particular that you can think of that was like just a fucking rotten apple? You don't have to name them, obviously, but well, any sort of instances in no, particular no, no. where you So think- I was in internal affairs for five years, all right? So I was... Um, so I was originally what's called CIB2, Criminal Investigation Bureau, and then we became Internal Affairs Command, and then we became Director of Professional Standards. So if you're in the Met, you know exactly what I'm talking about, basic internal affairs. So for five years, all I dealt with was corrupt cops or cops that had done wrongdoings, or I'd we also dealt with cops that... Um, so any shootings? So... so um, so that was a kind of my remit, and that was where I ended up travelling all over the world doing various jobs. We may talk about that later on. Um, so, of course, I came across plenty of corrupt cops within internal affairs. In my other commands, did I come across cops that did the what I call a low level of wrongdoing? Um, yeah, of course I did. Not not many, but 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 I did. Yes, but but on the whole, I've got to be honest, Danny. In thirty years, I, I rarely saw any wrongdoings. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but me personally, I'm sorry, me personally, I saw very little wrongdoings. But again, I like to think I created an atmosphere where if you crossed the line, I would not be happy. You know, I had a bit, you know, I, I was a bit of an old school nightmare. So for example, <laughs> yeah, Paul's laughing. Right, so I would, you know, if I was angry I was, was going to say you still are mate you're not yeah, 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 yeah. used to be yeah, no, you know it's part of my personality you know of course it is you know and I'm Paul, Paul so Paul used to be my boss a couple not, of years not, ago not in the police yeah 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 <laughs> you know and, and you know we, we are good mates but I, I gave Paul a hard time on a number of occasions and it's just the way that I am and um, you know I um, expected really really high standards when I was in charge of whatever department or as a DS or DI it doesn't matter I expected high standards I mean, I can tell you one story where, where... I'd love a story. Right, okay. So this is what we're talking about, high standards. Right, and I don't mind saying this because this, this was all over the press and this has been out there. So many years ago, I got sent to the Falkland Islands um, when I was part of Internal Affairs because the cops on the Falkland Islands were corrupt. I It was my job. I, I had the very first phone call from a previous police officer from the Falklands who phoned me up, um, or he phoned what we call a confidential right line I just happened to be walking past the office. I don't normally pick up that phone. And I picked up the phone because it was ringing and ringing. And it was this guy who lived in Portsmouth, ex-cop from the Falkland Islands. And he said, you're never going to believe what's happening down there. And that's how it started. So I went down, took a statement. um, And we, according to what he was saying, uh, a lot of the cops in the Falkland Islands, basically it was the Wild West. You know, there was no judicial system. They were making decisions. People were getting arrested, not arrested, so on and so forth. So I compiled a report. Uh, Hazel Blears, who was the policing minister, or minister without portfolio, but she was the liaison between um, ourselves and the government. She worked for Tony Blair. She was an MP. Incidentally, now has been kicked out because of expenses, but that's another story. Um, she authorised us to go to the Falkland Islands. Um, right. So, went down there. Um, the, chief, the detective chief superintendent came down with us, uh, a couple of senior officers and, and myself and another couple of officers. A team of seven went down there. To cut a very long story short, the chief, the detective chief superintendent, started having an affair with the attorney general who lived on the island. 
right? So type misogyny right at the very start. Here we go. Right. So she's married to oh, an the most hatred towards women there, yeah, mate. It's quite the opposite. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> He's so, having a great time. So the Attorney General <laughs> He's loving that one. So, so basically when we compile the report, the Attorney General's got to make the final report before it goes like to the CPS back back in England. So she's got to remain completely neutral. Again, he's married, she's married. So it went on. I only realised it after a couple of days because the island is really small. We stayed at Port Stanley, population about 2,000. And then I realised what was going on, right? So we, were, we had a dinner at the Malvinas restaurant and she suddenly appears. And I'm like, what's she doing here, right? And then she goes out, he go, and I can see them kissing. So I'm like, I'm going... Fucking hell, I don't fucking... I'm a, I'm a DS acting DI, right? So I'm, he's a detective chief superintendent. I'm a sergeant inspector yeah, yeah, with a DI, yeah. right? So I'm a few ranks below him, but I'm not, you know, I've, I've been around a bit. So anyway, he comes back in, she's disappeared, and I'm fuming. I'm absolutely going nuts internally, not saying anything. The whole team's there. I've got cops and we've got people, you know, I've got to try and contain this, but deal with it. So I went, boss, can I have a word with you? Can I have a word with you? So he's looking at me. Yeah, what do you want, John? I said, come on, let's come outside. I just need to have a quick chat with you. So I said, what are you doing? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, I've just seen you kiss that, that lady. He goes, he goes, John, I don't know. I said, don't fucking bullshit me. I've just seen you kissing that lady. <laughs> right? Oh, I love her, John. I love her. I'm going, for fuck's sake, she's married to an Islander. You're married. She's the Attorney General. Anyway, cut long story short, I ended up grabbing hold of him, <laughs> putting him against the wall and saying, stop it now. <laughs> Words to that effect. Might have been a bit stronger. This one of my other one of the other DSs witnessed me do that. Um, and off he goes. He starts crying and off he crying. goes. Yeah, he started crying. Started crying <laughs> and off he goes. Next thing, one of my other mates who's there said, What the fuck's going on, John? So I told him. I then go back and I'm like just fucking strangled a fucking detective chief superintendent. You know what I mean? There's a hierarchical system in the job. So cut long story short, we had a little walk along the seafront and he'd, he'd fallen in love with her. Allegedly, she'd fallen in love with him. But I said, nah. I said, mate, not happy. Not so happy why, why does it matter? Right. So what it matters is, one, you talk about professionalism, yeah. right? He's married. She's married to an islander. We're on an island, 2,300 people. We're 8,000 miles from home. It's cl it's massively unprofessional. Yeah. And two, she has to remain independent of the investigation because the evidence that we... So uh, he can so influence her decisions on people. Yeah, well, well, say it like, could be perceived like that. No, yeah, could, yeah. yeah that, that's what, what I'm mean? saying. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it could be perceived like that. So obviously, allegedly, he told me at that point he stopped it there and then. He was lying to me because eventually when, when the investigation finished, she left husband and they, they moved in together because one day, about three months later, I'll get a phone call from another mate. It was, from, it was page seven of the News of the World. It was a whole page spread about um, this particular officer and, and what he had done. But that's what I'm saying. So what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter about me, about rank. What If I have to deal with something, I will deal with it. You know, I'm not saying it came out in the, in the right way. And, and you could argue, well, John Strang, your boss, is probably not the best thing in the world. I, I feel like you definitely couldn't get away with that these days, though. So I wanted to ask. I agree. I, I, agree. To, I agree. When we were talking a little while back, a yeah. minute ago, I wanted to ask then, like, we talked about the wokeness of today's society and the police yeah. force. And I wanted to ask what advice you would give to somebody like coming into the police force, like right now and how they navigate that. And obviously those sort of situations, that reaction, way of dealing with it, you just couldn't yeah. do that these days. So, so, so am I right in thinking, guys, and obviously I'm a little, you know, I'm half a generation, generation older than you guys. So woke, are we talking political correctness? Mate, it's such a big thing, isn't it? It's like, it's, it's not just political correctness, it's, it's genderizing people, it's, yeah. it's, it's fucking loads of different... So if you Google woke... That that's basically what it means, right. but it's it's almost gone to a whole other level now, where you right. you know everybody's getting offended by everything everybody says, and you literally just can't you almost can't speak freely anymore, yeah. for risk of offending people. So, in that situation, you know, being a questionably a little bit aggressive with somebody probably couldn't do that. I agree. You I, know, I totally it's, agree. It's that type of thing. So yeah, yeah. it's yeah, it's just navigating that that sort of control of your speech through the fear of offending people. But how far is this going to go, though? Who knows? It can't go any further. Hopefully can not. It, do you know what I mean? Like, it can't go any further, can no. it? Because you, police, police won't be able to do their I, job. I think, no. I think, I think so in this yeah, day and age, I think, yeah, you know, I mean, do you know what? I, I'd probably find it really difficult, if I'm being honest, to, to advise somebody. Um, you've got to, you know, 
I, I would say to somebody that you've got to be professional at all times. But then the problem with that is it's different people's interpretation. So what one person's interpretation of being woke is completely different from somebody else. So I could say things to you guys if we were cops, you wouldn't bat, you wouldn't bat an eyelid. Mm. Right, but then I could have two different cops and say exactly the same thing, and all of a sudden they're upset, so on and so forth. So it's very, very difficult. Yeah. I do think that this young generation are growing up in this world, aren't they? So they find it easier than we do. They're so much more accepted. Exactly, they, and, you know, and they, they understand. You know, it's teachers. I mean, my, my stepson's fifteen, and, and obviously some of the stories he tells from the teachers. Oh, but but they're, they're brainwashed, aren't they? They can't. So so they're coming out of school now. For, you know not really saying anything at all for fear of upsetting somebody. So so the younger generation, I think, find it a lot easier than perhaps that if you were joining now, Danny, or I was going to go back in, or, or yourself, Paul. That, that, you know, we would probably, we would seriously struggle, but I think the younger generation find it a lot easier. Um, in terms of me advising, I, I think it's, it's, it's virtually impossible, isn't it? Yeah. It's so virtually it, impossible. So it sounds like you think potentially part of the issue is you've got the sort of older generation still actively working in the police force. The world is changing, you know, in real time. And they maybe, I don't know, haven't had the training or the support to, to be able to adjust to that. 100%. And, and the thing is, it's very difficult. If you've been raised a particular way, whether it's at home, I mean, luckily for me, some people might argue. So I, I joined the police at 19. And listen, I was, I was then brought high um, grammar school boy, left at 16. I, I flunked all my O levels, went to the dockyard, still thought I was going to be a professional footballer. That never happened. And, and luckily for me, I joined the police, but I was naive as hell. Didn't know anything about life. I was very lucky. I ended up on a team with a really strong governor um, who, who, in fact, disciplined me. But, but it, I didn't have a problem with it. But, but I was moulded. Um, I was institutionalised with a particular way of working. But luckily, the relief that I was on, it was all about hard work, ethics, support each other. Uh, we were a very close knit team. And I carried that on for the rest of my career. But you could have gone on another team where bullying was rife, uh, unprofessionalism. It all depended. Um, when you first started in the police, I was lucky, um, and I, I think very fondly of of uh, those first two years. Hard as hell, early late at nights, you're out on the streets every day, um, and uh, I had a very strong inspector, the deputy Ginge Wickington, he was called ex Royal Marine, so we had a real strong discipline. Um, so you're saying that though, but now would they even be allowed to to put in that discipline in the police? No, probably not. Are no, they? bullying. Would that be called bullying? There's right? no way was it bullying. For example, when the governor walked into the office right on parade, we would stand up, we would take our hats off, we would show our appointments. Um, we had to make sure that our notebook was done with disc wall drivers, people that were wanted or failing, you know, and there was a proper, proper kind of discipline and respect. I remember my very first arrest. So night, I, so you do six months at Hendon, then you do a 10-week what's called a street duty course, and then you go out on patrol. And my very first shift was night duty on a Friday night. Um, and it was the very first time that I went out on my own. Never been out on my own at all. Uh, I walked, so I was based at Uxbridge Police Station in West London. I walked out, walked up to the um, car park, which is literally two minutes from the Nick. And I discovered a car and a TATS disc was different to the car. So, you know, in the old days you have a TATS disc. People remember. A I, can't, I can't. I can barely yeah, remember that. Yeah, you know, yeah, disc. Yeah, yeah. Disc would be, I've, I've owned. I've owned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These no, guys have never had a tax disc. No, I've, I've, owned, I've owned a few. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. oh I have. <laughs> um, so on the tax disc was a registration number, but the registration number was different from the car. So I went, oh fucking hell, it's lost and stolen. And I've only been out ten minutes. So right, so I hit round the corner. I waited about 20, 25 minutes, <laughs> and this young kid came along, jumped out on him, giving it all of this, you know, as you do, and he pissed himself. The so fuck did you say to him for him well, to piss himself, uh, John? I, I, so, I, so looking back now, perhaps a little bit too vociferous, but like, I'm 19, 20, you know, I didn't have a clue really. And um, and anyway, I arrested him for, for the um, car. Uh, uh, I thought it was a stolen car. Um, and then obviously a, a more senior cop came. And what happened was it was the task disc that was stolen, not the car. So he was a groundsman. And he used to do this ride along huge lawnmower, which had a tax disc. And all he did was he couldn't afford the tax disc. Anyway, cut long story short, that was it. So it was still theft, but not of the car. It was theft of a tax disc. <laughs> but anyway, it was my first arrest, 10 minutes into my shift. So I was like, oh, my fucking hell, yeah, it's fucking brilliant. So I walked back, spent the next hour and a half telling everybody, yeah, yeah, I've got body in the bin, body in the bin. I've only been out 10 minutes. Was that what you, it's, is, is getting arrests a big thing in the police? Probably, like, it's silly. Probably like, not now. 
but, but back, back then, then it was, and 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 the fact that I'd only been out ten minutes, it was it was. Did a you get big more clout me. within the police for yeah. having more arrests? So do. like, as someone who's like a fucking machine, yeah. just getting everyone. You know what I mean? I'll tell you later. So but, drops but, a fag, but. but because I was really busy in the Met, it obviously my my career went quicker than most because of obviously the work that I did. So, yeah. so obviously you did get judged, not not on paper, but you did get judged on your arrests, your process, your jobs that you put in. So anyway, I spent the next hour and a half going around the whole police station telling everybody what a great job I've done and, you know, that I'm the main man. And then the governor, Peter Hughes, love him to death and became really good mates and massive amount of respect for him. So John, where's your notes? Because Pace, please come on. So when you arrest somebody, the first thing you do is you write your notes. Okay, whilst the facts are fresh in your mind, it is the fundamentals of policing. You arrest somebody, you do your notes. I just spent an hour and a half <laughs> telling everybody. <laughs> so, John, I don't forget, I'm still a probationer, just, just literally out of street duties. So um, he goes, where's your notes, John? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, Gov. I haven't done them. He absolutely fucking bollocked me. Mm. What do you mean? Notes have to be done at the time, blah, blah, blah. Get in the office. You fucking do your notes now. <laughs> and I want to see him out. Oh, fuck it. Now. I'm shaking. I'm now shaking. So I've gone from up here, down here, shaking like a leaf, right? So I do my notes, you know, day, date, time and place for the, if any police officers are watching. I was on patrol, blah, blah, blah. When I saw, blah, blah, blah. So I did all the notes. Went back, showed him. Brilliant. Fantastic, John. Like what you're doing. Next time. Do your notes as soon as yes, Gov. Thanks, Gov. I bet you never forgot to do your notes after that, though, did you? Yeah. And this is this is this is the thing. I was chatting to somebody about this the other day because I, as you know, grew up in a rough area. Always held accountable because you mouth off, you get beat up. Went to a rough school, <laughs> got bullied, <laughs> been in fight gyms, no, well. get teased. I mean, I, I'm just used to that, so I prefer someone just to give me a bollocking. And I, when they do, I never forget it. Yeah. But obviously, again, you can't do that these days. Yeah. And one of the other things that came out of the report was inadequate management. Yeah. And I thought that was quite interesting because th there's two things I, I wondered. One was exactly that, because you can't now do that. And therefore, to just, you know, is the management poor as a result? The other thing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, you, you, you may or may not know, but I heard that a few years ago, or at some point in the past, there was a pension change in the police. Correct. And as I a result, it very well. Yeah, and as a lot of that, as a result of that, a lot of the the sort of more experienced senior officers retired or left because of the changes. Right, no. And did that strip out some of the experience? Yeah, so that's not right. But you're right. That I, I can tell you about that yeah. later on. That okay. there was an effect on that, but it's a different effect. Right. But I remember the day very well. Um, do you want to talk to you about the first thing first about the discipline? Yeah, of the, I, of the senior officers. Yeah, I guess so. I'm just trying to understand, I guess, that the comment around inadequate management. Yeah. So, your thoughts on where that comes so from? So, what's happened? It certainly happened towards the end of my career. So, what what happened is you got to a situation where officers, senior officers, were afraid to discipline mm -hmm. for fear of being called a bully. Or uh, you know, we, so in the Met, we had discipline, we had grievance procedures, we had different procedures where where people could complain about you. I, I had a couple of grievances where people weren't happy about the way that I dealt with things with them. Um, and some would be dealt with uh, through one-to-ones and some would be dealt with through discipline. You know, you'd, you'd actually, we, the form was called a 163 where you, we would get informed that you're now a part of a, an investigation. The problem we had was that cops, senior cops, or, or, or cops that had supervisory status, so your sergeants, inspectors, chief inspectors and above, basically were too afraid to, to, to discipline, um, hadn't been given the right tools. And so what was happening is a lot of bad behaviour was being allowed to continue because the cops were afraid or, or the super supervisors were afraid to discipline them for fear of being accused of bullying. So that definitely happened. Uh, and towards the end of my career, I could see it happen more and more and more. So... I'm not saying you say I'm not saying you would turn a blind eye, but rather than deal with something robustly, mm. it would be like, oh mate, don't do that again. Come on. When really that officer either should have been it stuck on for discipline, yeah. should have been given either, you know, a, a recorded written warning, verbal warning, whatever. It was dealt with weak you know from a weak point of view. It's like fucking catch twenty two though, isn't yeah. it? Because you've literally got in the same report inadequate management, bullying culture. So it's almost like you can't do wrong for doing right. Yeah, mate, that's, that's welcome to the world of police. But so I, that's, that's never changed. So from day one, sorry, Danny, from day one, right? And this is the this is the issue with the police that I get really frustrated about, especially on the news. So the news always report about poor or bad police behaviour, never about the millions and thousands of good things they do. But you're right, you, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And that's always been the same. I've accepted it. So I've accepted that on some days, I'm going to get praised to the hilt for doing exactly the same thing and another day, I'm going to be lambasted. And I've been I've been lambasted by 
by by everybody up to um, Shadow Home Secretary, uh, and I've been praised right up to, to Lord Mayor of, of London. So it's it's it is part and parcel of the job. But the difference is, I don't moan about it; I've accepted it. Yeah, and you were going to talk about the, the pension thing, and right? It's the pension thing. Yeah. So what happened is, so I was very lucky. I was under the old pension scheme, which is final salary. So basically, um, and you get. Um, Three years worth of lump sum. You, you can you can divide twenty five percent off. But basically, it's, it's a really good golden golden pension they call it, uh, and it's basically done in your last three years in the service. Then on a, on a particular date, they change the pension scheme. It was going to be average salary, and guess what? You're going to do forty years instead of thirty. You're going to pay more into your pension and get less. So what happened is on this particular day, it, you could fall into the old pension scheme and still do your thirty years, get a nice little payoff, or you're going to have to work up to. It's pro rata, but work up to 40, 40 years, average pension, and pay more into it. So what happened, luckily I was on the ill pension scheme, so it didn't affect me, but but funny enough, there was two two DCIs at Hounslow when it came in. Uh, my other my other guy, my other colleague, he was didn't have as much service as me, so he fell into the, the new system. And that caused massive division. It caused massive, um, you know, people were obviously clearly upset because they thought they are doing 30 years, getting a decent pension. All of a sudden, they're going to have to do up to 40 years just get an average pension. So it caused massive issues in terms of morale. But I wasn't aware of anybody leaving early. Right, okay. Because if you left early, you would have had less pension. Yeah. But what it did do is cause a massive morale problem. Um, I'm not sure what's happened. I know people were trying to get it to court, to court, to court. Yeah. But this has gone through Parliament. And at the moment, it's staying. Yeah, and I guess with stuff like that as well, like with anything, if if the package is less good, then you're going to get less quality people coming into the force or the, the service, right? So maybe that's something to do with it. And also, Paul, you know, people don't get this, and I'm sure maybe we'll, we'll talk about this later on. It's a hard life, mm. right? I never realised really how hard it was until the end of my career. It's an incredibly hard life. So I was a detective for 20 years, on call for most of those 20 years. Uh, sometimes I'd work three or four days continuously, no break. You've got a missing child, you've got a murder suspect. What, you go home, have a cup of tea? Of course you don't. You're out there dealing with it. And... Um, and I was burnt out. I was frazzled towards the end. I had a couple of episodes. We might talk about it later on during my career, which kind of indicates as to where I were. If you do the job properly and you are 100% in it for the long haul, 30 years is probably where it's, it's probably all you can do. Yeah. You know, and you're expecting cops in their 60s to be on call, working long hours, extended hours. It's going to be incredibly tough for them. Mm. So let's, let's get on to your career then. So 30 years is a long old time. Yeah. Um, made up to DCI. So just to put that into perspective for people, that's John Luther's rank, right? John Luther, mate. Yeah. So, uh, I hate that program. <laughs> I hate that program. Did watch the last film, but I hate it. Yeah. But anyway, go on. Do you like Line of Duty? Do you know, so Line of Duty, so I, I was in Internal Affairs. Is it so, uh, AC-12? Is it AC-10? Whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. That's the joke that's I used to play, especially at Heathrow. <laughs> I've got to be honest. So, so I used to watch um, uh, The Bill in the day. Uh, and people don't believe me, but but it's true. The only reason I joined the police is I wanted to be D.I. Burnside. Do you remember Frank Burnside? Probably before your time. Yeah, no, I, so I remember a, the show. I don't remember the so, character. So those that remember know he's a hard cop. He's a D.I., blah, blah, blah. And I, and I said to myself, I want to be D.I. Burnside. I was far worse than D.I. Burnside. That's the truth. But anyway, um, I don't watch any cop programs because I've got to be honest, they're dull. Compared to, apart from the Luther program, we had like 50 people be dying a day, but, but the last <laughs> Luther film, you know, most of them compared to real life actually is dull. It, they're uninteresting. And in real life, trust me, it's far worse. It's a lot harder, a lot more complex, a lot more interesting. The characters are far more interesting. So I don't watch a lot of cop stuff. Yeah. Do you know, I find that with, with all sorts of professions where people are actually in it and they watch the shows yeah. and they're like, fucking nonsense. Honestly. It's, it's, and, and it's all dramatised, isn't it? Yeah, you know what I mean? It's all like... Because like, I'm always going, that's crap. But, you know, just it's ruining like, John, it, John, just shut up, just shut up. <laughs> you know, we're just watching it. And I honestly... And especially these days as well, because you can't have old school coppers <laughs> bollocking people because they'll get, get yeah, cancelled. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, cool. So yeah, so your career then. So yep. thir 30 years, long career, made up to DCI. You mentioned just a second ago, actually, that you'd 
you, the way you'd worked, you progressed quite quickly. So, and, and I guess you must have seen fucking all sorts as well, mate. So funny shit, scary shit. Yeah, yeah. So, so talk us through, I guess, you know, kind of, you, you already mentioned you, you covered the early stories. Yeah. Talk us through your career a little bit in regards to kind of your progression through the ranks, what you saw along the way. Yeah, brilliant. So, so boys, if you, you want to come in at any time, come in. So obviously started at Uxbridge in West London. Um, so I did my first three years there, uniform, early lates and nights. Um, looking back on it, absolutely brilliant part of my career. Everybody was together. You worked as one team. You supported each other. Um, if I'm being brutally honest, it was quite incestuous. Uh, if I'm being brutally honest, you know, um, you know, most of the girls went out with the boys. Most of the boys went out with the girls within. within. Um, but it was an amazing time. Quite hierarchical. All right. So, for example, you'd go into the canteen. So, even with, so you're on probation for two years, but there'd be different levels. of So, you'd be junior probation mid-probation, senior probation. Then you'd be a PC. Then you'd be a van driver, IRV driver, which is instant response vehicle, area car driver, which is the big fast cars. Then you'd be acting sergeant. Then you'd be skippers. And then you'd have the governor. Now, depending on where you were, you would then sit in the canteen on the table. You'd never sit on the top table, obviously. You, so if you were a junior probate, sometimes you couldn't even sit in the canteen because there weren't enough tables and you couldn't go on those particular tables. No but here's the rub. Way. You'd walk into a canteen and all you would hear is laughter, right? All you would hear is laughter. People telling jokes, people telling stories, all right? If you needed any help, you'd see the right person. And that's the way it was. You go into police canteens today, if you can find a police canteen that's open, quiet is a quiet thing. There's nothing. There's no atmosphere. There is no enjoyment. There is no laughter, all right? And that's the, what we talked about earlier about political correctness or woke. I'm not sure. All right. But back then it was real atmosphere, but it was a real clear hierarchical system. I progressed really quickly. I, I, I became a driver, which is virtually unheard of during the probation within about uh, three or four months. And I got moved from Uxbridge to Ryslip because once you're a driver, you're independent. You know, you're not walking out with anybody. You can do a lot more calls and bits and pieces. Uh, and after three years, oh, I'll tell you an interesting story. Right. So I was 21 during my, um, during my, my years at Uxbridge. Anyway, my, I was 21. And it was a Friday night shift. And because I was new, I hadn't really booked it off. And of course, back then, you know, I'm a young lad, a fit boy. So obviously, you just party quite a bit, party hard, work hard. So, oh, yeah, yeah, Sarge, can I have that Friday off? No, no, John, we, we, we've done the minimum strength. You can't have the Friday off. I said, but yeah, but it's my 21st birthday. No, 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 no. He said, you're going to have to work it. I said, what, really? I said, I'm only 21. I said, you can't, you know, I want to go out. You know, he's got the wheeling back in those days. No, no, you've got to work it, John. Fucking hell. So anyway, so um, we start nights on a Monday and we finish, obviously, Monday, uh, Sunday evening going into Monday, seven day stretch on nights. So we've got to Friday and of course everyone's taking the piss because obviously they all know I'm 21 and I'm working rather than having it off. Like, ah, John, happy 21, what are you doing? Yeah, you're working night duty. Oh, fuck off. So anyway, um, so Peter Hughes, the governor, to teach me a lesson, said, right, John, you're out walking. When you walk, nobody wants to walk. You want to go in a car, van, area car. You want to do anything but walking. Right? Because walking is, because it's dull, mate, it's not interesting. Boring, it, you yeah. can't get to any of the decent calls. And basically, all you're going to do is report a bit of crime. You may see something in front of you, but but, but nobody wants to walk. Everyone wants to drive. Oh, you can walk the high street, John. Oh, Fucking hell, God, God. <laughs> fucking great. So um, we always had tea, tea and biscuits at the start. We had a, obviously we had a briefing, tea and biscuits, and, and out I went. And I was like, I was not happy. I was like head down, like just completely disinterested. So I'm walking along Oxbridge High Street, and there's a guy sitting down on the pavement. He's got his feet in the middle of the road, and the cars. Yeah, sorry, he's got his feet in the middle of the road, and the cars are drying around his feet. Yeah, mate, sit on the pavement, mate. You know, just just get your feet off the road, mate. The cars, you're gonna get your, you're gonna get squashed feet. No, why should I? He was drunk. Did you, did you drunk. say, please, please, it's my birthday? Yeah, no, I didn't. Sorry, <laughs> didn't. No, I didn't do any of that. But, I, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't even interested in it. I was just like, mate, just sit on the pavement, mate. The cars are driving around. I, I was, obviously, I was so sad and depressed for working. <laughs> I just couldn't be bothered. Anyway, he wouldn't do it. So I'm standing there going, fuck me. It's mate, just put yourself on the pavement. Otherwise, the car's going to go into you and you're going to have both feet. No, I don't fucking, why should I, you know, and started to swear at me. Right, mate, listen, if you carry on swearing, you're going to be arrested. So again, for the cops that are listening, Section 5 Public Order Act, someone's swearing and there's members of the public, you, you, you know, you can give them a warning, harassment, alarm, or distress, and, and, and you give them a warning. If they swear again, they just get arrested. 
So look, mate, if you carry on swearing, obviously it's a busy Friday night, there's people walking around. I said, you're going to get arrested. Oh, fuck off. Why don't you? And, oh, and I'm like, oh, fucking hell. Like, I've only been out for five minutes. Right, that's it. You're arrested. So I was like, that's it. So um, got hold of him. And um, he, he's a little, he's not violent, but he's, he's, he's probably more drunk and disorderly than anything else. But, but you could tell he, you know, he was close to throwing a punch. So um, I thought, right, I'm going to have to cuff him. So I cuffed him, which wasn't a problem. And then, right, what's your name? John. Yeah, right, what's your surname? Kennedy. Mm-hmm. I said, <laughs> what are you doing? He said, I'm out celebrating my birthday. He said, I said, what's your date of birth? He said, my birthday. So I went, what, you're John Kennedy and you're celebrating your 21st birthday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going, fucking wind up. <laughs> so wind up. Because this like. Mate, I was just thinking, this feels like that scene at a fight club where he yeah. suddenly realises he just gets a red. Yeah, yeah, honestly. Because this play, honestly, boy, I mean, Paul knows it with me. You will, people have spent hours, days, getting wind ups. And, and so I'm there. That's now, got you. Yeah. Fuck me. So I am now fucking looking around going, those fuckers have done it to me. They've wound me up. But I can't see anybody. And I could hear other things going on the radio. So, so cops were going to calls and bits and pieces. So, so I just got hold of them, put them against the wall. I said, just, just wait a while. And I, I, cause I'm thinking- They were going to come out. Yeah, yeah, they're doing a wind up, but nothing. I, and then, then I'm looking at him and, I'm, and I could just see it's real. John Kennedy out celebrating his 21st birthday. You can make it up. So I took him back and took him back. I'm, I'm still thinking it's a, all the way. I'm thinking it's a wind up. Going back in the custody suite. And I'm still thinking it's a wind up. And then the skipper books him in, and I realise then it's not a wind up. So he goes in the cell. What's the get, fucking odds of that? Yeah, yeah, the odds of that. <laughs> so I felt so sorry for him. I gave him three hours to sober up and released him no further action. So, anyway, so, so, so he had a, the exact same name and well, date well, of I'm birth. I'm Jonathan. So I'm Jonathan, but everyone calls me John. Yeah. Right. But but yeah. So so obviously I, I wasn't even thinking was he John or Jonathan because most Jonathans are John. They are. So so yeah. So but he was John J O H N. Oh, so he was just John. yeah. So when, so, me, so, when yeah. We, so when we got his driving license and bits and pieces, because obviously yeah. you get searched, he was John. So obviously I realised then he, he was not Jonathan. But yeah. But honestly, you couldn't make it up. No, that's that's couldn't fucking make mental, it up. Isn't it? That is mental. But anyway, so so um, yeah, three years at Uxbridge. Um, so I had started getting a reasonable good name for myself and I was obviously I've always been into my fitness so then I applied to join the territorial support group which back then is the right place normally you'd have about 10 years service before you get in it's, it's experienced cops big lads you spend the first two hours of, of every day in the gym uh, and back then we did a lot of stuff there wasn't many uh, police officers with guns on the streets so we dealt with a lot of kind of really violent behaviour, gangsters, organised crime groups, etc. So I got in, surprised I got in, but I got in. And um, and would you believe it, the governor was an ex-captain um, in the Paris, football mad, I was football mad. I got my PTI's course there as a six-week course, uh, and I became the PTI of the unit. Um, so it's had some great times. Funny enough, I saw more bullying in the TSG than I did What's the anywhere TSG? else. The Territorial Support Group. Okay. So, the, so, so basically, it's a, it's a bunch of cops um, who specialise in public order and and people that are, that the normal cops can't deal with. We did lots of burglary initiatives and lots of robbery initiatives as well. And we're a large unit. We've got riot gear. We've got long shields, short shields. We've got fire retardant helmets. All this kind of stuff. So I did that for a few years. Um, I enjoyed it to start with, didn't enjoy it towards the end. Um, what are you but, saying about bullying? What do you mean by that? What, towards each other? Just being yeah, dickheads? Yeah, so, so just... basically, yeah, dickheads. Yeah, so there was, because the cops, because the boys were quite big. That's what I mean. Is, is it just like that kind of lad mentality? With yeah, well, well, that's sure. it. You got, you got banter and bullying. It's not the same thing. No, it's not. And, 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 I mean, maybe, maybe it's... So, I, so one, of, one of the guys was an acting PS. What's I'm, that? I'm not going to... So an acting sergeant, sorry, acting police sergeant. Big bodybuilder, all right, from Wales. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but 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 he, he he was all right. He wasn't he wasn't the most dynamic individual, but he was he was a decent lad. And so only one day, I'd gone out on shift. I'd arrested somebody. So the way it worked back then is then the, 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 we all went out on these like public support vehicles, these carriers. So they come back. I have to wait for a lift back, and I came back four or five hours later, and um, I went into the chat, and I could hear this guy crying, and. Um, and I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? So this particular acting sergeant's crying his eyes out. So well, what's up, fella? What's up? He said, look, John. So obviously we're in the changing room and all the lockers. There's a locker missing. 
<laughs> where his locker's missing. I said, what the fuck's going on? Where's your locker? He said, come with me. It's on the fucking roof of the building. So they managed to get a crane and put his locker <laughs> with all the keys. Why is he cut. fucking crying? I'd fucking say I'd be like, you guns. Yeah, but he, he'd been bullied. <laughs> he, 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 oh, it, he, was that a lot? A yeah. yeah, yeah. Not, not a lot, but but he'd been bullied. I guess, it's, I guess it's if it's constant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and not reciprocated as well. Yeah, and then and the finish <laughs> If it's one-way traffic, <laughs> yeah, it's fucking hard. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and even though it was a big lump, you know, some of these cops are really clever. Oh, big, know, big lump for a reason, usually. Yeah, and his locker was on the roof of the building. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. So I stayed there. We got a crane from traffic and, and I stayed with him. We got his fucking locker, locker down and, and off he could go home. But um, but nicknames, you know, nicknames is a big thing. I mean, you know, when I lost all my hair, Chernobyl head, chemo head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly. Well, they would call you that. Yeah, so they're not not all the time, but they could, but they wouldn't, they could get away with it. Because well, obviously I was like, mm. yeah, but, 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 but I... Didn't see it as bullying. Bullying today. I guess when you're younger as well, if there's an older part, like, you know what I mean? A more senior yeah. rank person and all that. Yeah. You, you kind of just shut up, don't you? It's like one of those things in life, you yeah. know, when you're younger, you you take more. And as you get older, you think, fuck you. Really? But, but, yeah, I, but yeah. we, we talked about this before as well. I think almost like if you, especially like in the UK, if you've played sports, oh, fuck football, me. rugby, yeah. been in fight gyms, boxing... Like, it's just rife in those places. So if you grow up with yeah. it, it's yeah. fucking everything. I've got to be yeah. honest, the first guy that called me Chernobyl Head, I laughed. Yeah. I thought, do you know what, Chemo Head, I've heard Chemo Head all day long. But when you sure, I've never heard Chemo Head. I've never heard Chemo Head. Mate, you haven't lost your hair. You lost your hair. Yeah. But anyway, well, I, thought, I thought, you know, that's quite weird, actually. I'll give you that one. But, um, but yes, yeah, so, so on this particular unit, to be fair, that was the, the worst I've seen bullying. Interestingly, I guess I was indirectly bullied um, but no one ever bullied me to my face ever. Um, what do you mean by indirect? Well, things I, I so so everyone obviously got a bit now and then. And um, I came back once, and someone had, had smashed my my locker with a weird metal ass. So I came in one day, my my locker had been curveballed, you know, where they've obviously smashed my locker. Um, and um, so yeah, so you get bits, you, you, you know. You get indirect bits, you know, just cops getting. Is that drunk. just, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. Is that just them just being knobs and just Yeah, it probably is. It probably is. It's the office week and I'm never, just going to. Yeah, they, they never come to my face and say anything. Um, and I was already quite crime driven, whereas the TSG were more kind of public order focused. Um, so, um, and that's, I guess, towards the end, I didn't really enjoy it much because it just wasn't what I wanted to do. And then I left and then joined, or applied to join the CID, which I did, and I, I got directly into the CID. But, um, so, so, sorry, mate. So you said CID. I always forget what that stands for because I used to think it was cops in disguise growing up in a council estate. I don't think it is. What is it? Criminal Investigation Department. Okay, fine. So, yeah, so basically all of the um, plainclothes units within the Met... Sorry, I'm swinging from side to side there. <laughs> get quite relaxed, actually. Um, so all the plainclothes units in the Met, all the squads, they sit under the umbrella of CID, right. but then can be anti-terrorist, uh, murder squad, whatever. But they're all CID officers. Now, if you're a proper detective, and of course, if any uniform cops are watching, they'll know what I'm talking about. You train to become a detective... So in my day, it, uh, it was exams, it was interviews. It was quite hard, actually. It took a couple of years to become a qualified detective. And then you're entitled to have detective in front of your rank, detective constable, detective sergeant, and you can keep the detective rank. Now, what's great is I can do the job of a uniform cop, but a uniform cop can't do my job because you have to be a qualified detective. No extra pay, which used to seriously annoy me, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> no extra pay. Yeah, no extra pay. So, was it, so what was the point then? Was it just, so basically, just to be able to do more? So really? basically, um, if you wanted to specialise in plain clothes and do what I call the really interesting jobs, you have to be a detective. So right. basically, is that the it, same now? Is it like if you went into the police now, would yeah. you still? So, was so, it the same sort of system so, to get to, to that sort of level? Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, no, it's not. It's, it's a lot easier now. They're, they're so desperate for detectives now. You're getting fast track straight in because people don't want to be detectives because it's quite hard. It's a really hard job to do. Um, but basically, in essence, a detective is somebody that investigates crime. That's really the common denominator, regardless of what type of crime. It's investigation of crime, and then that's, that's your detective. So before you get into like your, your life as a, as a, a, a detective, um, just wanted to quickly go back to the last team you were in. You said it was the antisocial 
sort of baby team. Yeah. Would that be the sort of unit would deal with like football, hooligans yeah. and riots and stuff? So Have yeah. you got any so, stories about that? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So, um, so territorial support groups. So there's, there's loads of stories. Um, right. So talk about football. So we would uh, police, so Millwall, we were constantly fighting against Millwall, you know, so we'd get sent to, to, to Millwall and, and, and battle, battle them uh, every other Saturday. Were they that bad? They were, yeah. Because the thing with Millwall is the hooligan element was large. The, the, and their intensity of fighting, when I mean, they would attack police horses, they would literally attack police horses. Dogs, the police, uh, the dog handlers would never do it because they would attack the dogs. Oh, uh, yeah. they, were, they were animals, the, the Millwall boys. But hand-to-hand combat, I, I, I've got to be honest, they were, they was, you know, I didn't have a problem with that. They, well, they weren't they, trained, were they? they were no, just they weren't trained. And, nutters. And, and, <laughs> yeah, they were, but they were complete nutters. I mean, I got sent to Chelsea, to the Chelsea Headhunters back in the day. They used to uh, hang back at the back of the shed at, um, at Stamford Bridge. So we would do all the football stuff. And then any riots. So I remember uh, the only proper riot, uh, right, okay. So the only proper riot I dealt with with petrol bombs was the Brixton riots. Um, and um, so Brixton in, in South London, um, so we were, that's the one and only time I've been petrol bombed with petrol bombs. But what you don't get is the petrol bombs would go above our heads. So we'd be, we'll be in a line with long shields. So we'd have long shields, helmet on, we'd have our flame retardants on. And what they would do is they would throw the petrol bombs at the walls behind us. So the flames would come down on top of us. So the liquid <laughs> flames would come down on top of us. So, so I think I've mentioned this story to Paul once. So we were, I was at the Brixton riots. We got past that stage and we kind of pushed our way out so we weren't near the walls. But we're still getting petrol bombs, bricks, anything just chucked at us. Um, and obviously we had long shields. And then my mate next to me, and obviously we've got these really heavy wooden flame retardants and what they do... Is it wooden? Woolen. Oh, I was going to say yeah, I woolen. Thought, I, Sorry, woolen. I thought he said wooden. I was going to say it was the worst yeah. like, fire card I've ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> flame yeah. retardant. Yeah. Yeah. I tell, some wooden I tell, fucking I've never, never talked this much in my life, honestly. I've got dry lips. Um... So woolen, and of course they make you sweat profusely. Um, so you've got constant sweat running in your eyes and you've got, so honestly, nightmare. Anyway, so uh, my mate next to me, he says, John, John, I can't see, I can't see. I said, mate, you've probably got sweat in your eyes. He goes, no, no, it's more than that, John, I can't see, I can't see. So I look at him and I can see some holes. So we've got these um, uh, helmets with visors and there's some holes in the front of his visor. So I'm like, fucking hell, what's going on here? I said, Phil, Phil, just, just come back, come back, come back. So uh, I go to the skipper. I said, like, blah, blah, blah. So two guys take our place and we come back. And he's been shot in the head with a shotgun. <sighs> so so somebody in a high-rise flat opposite us, luckily it was pellets, mm. um, and they've penetrated the helmet. Luckily, they didn't penetrate his skull, but obviously he had about eight or nine pellets in his skull. And obviously oh. the blood had come down his face. So obviously we had to put it out. Guy, blah, blah, blah. So we, we withdrew back. Um, and then literally, the, because it's a riot scene, you can't get into the flats. And obviously, we got into the, it was long gone. What well, was all that over? Was it? Was it? It w- would have been over somebody being arrested and killed by a police officer. Right. Okay. Um, there was a few that happened. Um, I can't remember which individual, but it would it would have been protests against police brutality. Yeah, hundred percent. And then it escalates, escalates, escalates. Yeah, so with with the going back to the the football lads as well, yeah. what, were, were you in the stadiums or was that in the streets? No, so so because we were a mobile patrol, yeah. we would always be not in the stadium. Right, we'd okay. be out, but ready to go in if it had to. So you'd have different levels of public order training. You'd have your basic, then you'd have your level twos, which are your normal cops. Yeah. They they train twice a year, and then you have your level one, which is us. And every month. Mm-hmm. We specialise and we, we go to, back then it was called Hounslow Shield Training Centre and every month we'd go there practice our drills. So um, we'd be on a mobile patrol ready to help the level twos when basically. Like, when like Football Factory and Green Street and all that shit come out, yeah. was it, so, yeah. did it make it worse? Because I don't really know that people done that no. shit before that. It didn't make it worse. Didn't it? make it worse? So it was already bad? I quite was like it? Green Street actually, good film. Oh, it's but, rubbish. No, Fo- it's good football Factory is good. Green Street's a lot oh, of shit. Football, no, I, I find it the other way around. I thought Green ah. Street was good. But I'll football. be honest with you boys, I like them both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but it was think, all right, wasn't but, they, back in the day? Yeah, but I think by the time those films are, I think a lot of the, the football banning orders have come in and they were clamping down quite but, a lot. See, like, I, I didn't even know it existed really. I think because obviously I'm a bit younger and stuff, but I used to watch fucking Argyle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, Argo back in the day was was, was TCA. tasty. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, the, the Plimsock Posse before that, giving my age away now, and then obviously you had the TCA. Plimstock Posse? Plimstock Posse, yeah, they were the first group. Right. And then it and evolved then it into, into the central element. Yeah. Um, fucking hell. Um, 
But yeah, I didn't realize it was such a such a big thing. I thought the films maybe a like made it bigger but i guess not nah, maybe it all nah, died I mean, off by then i can remember um but mill war was supposed to be really yeah we had, a, we had a huge fight against mill war one I, I think it was a tuesday night game and it was absolute carnage we had we had mountain branch we had you know must have had 100 150 tsg officers then you had your level twos and it was just battle upon battle it was just pure pure you're just survival mode um you know, you're not you're not even thinking of arresting anybody. You're just thinking, I want to get home in one piece. How, how, That's how bad it is. How are you feeling in those situations? Is there a bit of a buzz or are you yeah. scared for your life? No. So um, so for me, I, I've been scared in my career, um, but public order, I've um, I've found it quite exciting. Really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't have a problem. Yeah, okay. I've you know, looked after myself. You yeah. know, and the lads are with. We, I was we were confident in each other. Yeah. You know, we're, most of the guys are with. We're kitted up as well, and you're kitted like, up. We're, yeah. we're spending two hours in the gym every day. You know, yeah. we, we've joined for a reason. We've joined because we like to have a bundle. You know what I mean? So <laughs> we, there was a term we used to call deck and dominate. That was our term. Yeah, I won't go into it dominate, too much. Yeah. Um, but but you know we, we we you know we didn't have any problems. I so the way that I worked because obviously I had a bit of a CRD head on. on I, I was into crime. We would look at. Um, areas with high robberies or we would look at areas where there are known hardened criminals and we would deliberately target them mm. like mate good you as boys, you should yeah, exactly you boys ain't gonna muck around when we're around you yeah. know and we'd give them hard times you know what i mean and that's and that's how we kind of did our business so we were pan london so we were allowed to patrol all over london we didn't have a particular area so we were what's called a pan london patrol group so we could go over london and just target these individuals and um and basically try and help out you know the officers on the street on those particular Burrows, and that's what we did. Well. Um, I've got this photograph here. I let you boys go through it. So, so what we also used to do is is Notting Hill Carnival, and and I guess if you're from Plymouth, you're not really aware of Notting Hill Carnival. So it's a, a second... lot of our viewers are in London, to be fair. Ah, there you go. Then, so you'll know it. So it's the second largest carnival in the world outside of Rio. Uh, a million people over the two days. Um, I know it really well because the last few years um, I was what's called bronze crime. So. I was one of the very few senior detectives that was always public order trained. So in so in big public order situations, I would be called to be in charge of crime, but I've also got a public head public order head on as well. So four or five years on the trot, I was bronze crime. But anyway, this is a story when I was in the TSG, the, the Territorial Support Group. So obviously we used to go up there. And for those people that live in London, not in a hill, so you've got a family day on the Sunday and the Monday is just carnage. Your crime is rife. What do you mean? What? Why though? What, what are they doing? Like dealing drugs? Are they just yeah? Fucking... Drugs, drink, get excited. Uh, sorry, the gangs come in and they target. You get a lot of um, nice people that come in and have no idea. They've got expensive watches, jewelry. So you get gangs from all over the UK coming in, steamrolling them, snatching, robbing. Um, it's complete carnage. Um, so one day we're we're um, and this is this is to emphasise how hard it is to be a cop all right and what you see sometimes is not what you get so we're on patrol you, you boys have got the photographs <laughs> there well yeah we're on we're on patrol and um so so in a tsg unit we call it one three and 21 one inspector three skippers and 21 pcs so we're on patrol and all of a sudden this huge black guy runs through the crowd he's got a broken beer bottle he is covered in blood um so obviously committing a public order offense clearly so he gets put on the ground, it's there on the photographs, um, and he gets arrested. Now, I can see from the corner of my uh, my peripheral vision, there's somebody trying, wants to talk to me. But at that stage, the crowd had caught, caught, caught anti. We had to call urgent assistance, we had to call the mounted branch in, the dog unit in, because obviously we were then surrounded by hundreds of people who weren't happy that we had arrested this guy. And he's still shouting and swearing, um, so acting... Uh, in a really kind of aggressive state. So um, so anyway, I could see this guy wanting to talk. So anyway, I went over and talked to him. He said, look, mate, he said, that guy you've just arrested has just been stabbed in the back of the neck. And the guy that stabbed him is over there. And he pointed out this group of kids and, and this one particular guy. Really, really angry. I mean, I'm saying it in a nice way, but this guy clearly didn't like what we had done. So anyway, so I talked to him, I bring the skipper over, who funny enough said to Paul earlier on, his next Plymouth boy, um, explain it to him. I said, look, we've got to go and uh, arrest this guy. He, he's saying that guy over there, this young guy over there, um, has stabbed this guy. Uh, this, this, so this black guy that we arrested was a doctor 
and he had a Rolex on his on his wrist. So clearly the gang were obviously targeting him uh, to try and, uh, and nick his Rolex. So I went over um, and we managed to get hold of this guy. I searched him and in his pocket was a knife covered in blood. So so obviously he got arrested for robbery and assault. That was great because that was me off not any O'Connor when I was just in processing prisoners all day. Happy days. Um, but it's the, the, the reason why I'm telling you the story is it's really hard, isn't it? So you've got a guy. So obviously what had happened is they stabbed this guy in the back of the neck. Right, he wasn't having any of it, and obviously broke. He was obviously drinking a beer bowl, smashed it, and then ran after them to seek retribution. Why wouldn't you? But unfortunately, came through a police patrol, so got put on the ground. Obviously, um, um, so we arrested him for. Obviously, he got de-arrested, and obviously, I spoke, and he was good as gold. Actually, I arrested him, explained the situation, and he was good as gold. So, mate, I've got your mate that's done it, so on and so forth. And I think, if I remember right, this, this happened a long time ago, but he, he got. Like six, he got quite a severe custodial sentence, six, seven years, 18 years of age. So, so back then, that was a, was a really good result. Um, but then, so we, we done all this job, and literally about two months later, six, fo- six bundles of photographs just turned up in my locker. It'd been a sub- surveillance, covert surveillance photograph team on a block, and they'd photographed everything, mm. um, which obviously helped our case, funny enough. And obviously, I, I used that for court purposes. It's funny, uh, coming in, he was like, Oh, I've, I've got some photos, like. Yeah. If we can share them, I was like, yeah, yeah, we put them on the screen. <laughs> Turn up with a fucking book. <laughs> you fucking... Yeah, yeah. So, wow, so, so, so this is... Yeah, I mean, sure look, these, are, these are nearly 30 years old. I mean, this is nearly 30 yeah. years ago now. But it looks crazy. It must be so hard to navigate. I know there was, um, I think, a stabbing or a shooting at the recent one, wasn't there? Yeah. The first one after the, the lockdown. Yeah. It's crazy. It's funny, when I was looking at some of those photos, you can see that some of the, the lads in the photos are looking up directly at the camera. Yeah, yeah. So were they aware they were being yeah, yeah. surveillance and they so, were still so, at it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, um, you know, a lot of criminal gangs, you know, because our methods are our methods, yeah. they're not They're not that, they are stupid, but they're not that stupid. They yeah. know um, yeah. that so they're... So they're um, there's the guy getting arrested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they know... Um, that they're being looked at, and, and they, but they know they just walk around the corner. The angle of the camera is going to catch yeah. them. You know what I mean? So, so I, I imagine as well. And I again, I grew up in a rough area, so I've I've known lots of criminals over the yeah. years. Not not associated with any, but I've known plenty. He says that now. <laughs> but yeah. I can imagine, like knowing what some of them are like, they probably thought it was a bit of a game. They knew that they knew the old Bill were after them. And they were like, right, let's see if we can outsmart them, outfox them. Yeah, do you know what? I, I I've dealt with some um, what I call higher level criminals. And and back in the day, there was definitely a kind of mutual respect. Cat and mouse, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember having a couple of real, I'm not going to say tumble. I'm talking about fights with, with various kind of what I call mid to high level criminals. But once they were arrested, they were good as gold. There was definitely a bit of mutual respect. Um, whereas I do find now with the youngsters, there is no respect. Yeah, they'll, they'll stab you in the back. Yeah, without without a second thought. You know, there's no respect at all. Whether we, as as police, of of course that, I don't know, but um, there's no respect. Anymore. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one actually because I guess when you think about you know sort of crime going back or organised crime going back sort of you know twenty thirty years, you think about you know well, even further, but the, the craze and how they they came across obviously very serious criminals, very dangerous yeah. criminals, but presented themselves very well. You know, outside of the wrong side of them, yeah. they were gentlemen. You know, and you've got loads of crime families in London. And and do, does that does that kind of culture of, of crime still exist, or is it is it literally all the the sort yeah. of street gangs and stuff so, now? So the most so you talk me being scared. Yeah. So when I was a young DC detective constable at Hounslow Police Station, I dealt with a bouncer at Yates's who had had his throat slit literally from ear to ear. Now. It, it killed him, right? No, nope. no. Survived. He survived. So he okay, well. was an ex-American Marine. Okay. So he he toughed it out and he survived. Okay. I was the officer in the case, and um, and I ended up dealing with it. So we had a bit of CCTV. So this would have been um, late nineties. Uh, we had a bit of CCTV, um, and we had some witness statements, and it ended up being. The suspect and uh, this, this guy that I arrested, he worked for the Adams family. Now, if you're from London, I think one of the Adams brothers just recently been arrested. But the Adams family run uh, a lot of the drugs trade in uh, in London. And this guy, I can't name the name, unfortunately, but this guy was one of their, um, the, the, the easiest way to describe it is contract killer. So he, he was their enforcer. 
and he'd already done 12 years for killing a Irish guard, stabbed him in the heart, got 12 years for manslaughter. And before I arrested him, um, he was put up for drowning and torturing somebody literally two weeks before. And all I can tell you is that I dealt with this guy and we ended up getting arrested and he got a life sentence for um, attempted murder. I've never in my entire life seen evil in one person. He was the kind of guy you'd look at and I, I, honestly, even and I, I'm quite a hardened cop, or I was back then, even I was intimidated. And I remember once I had to further arrest him for another offence and I was in a room, just the two of us, and I had to, uh, we were on first name terms then because uh, we'd obviously been dealing with each other for a while and I had to further arrest him and he went ballistic. Now, I thought he might go ballistic and would you believe it because of my connections with the TSG, I had them waiting outside. <laughs> um, and um, But obviously I wanted to kind of show him that I was the boss as it were. Um, I wasn't the boss. So when you say he went to ballistic, did he become violent or just Yeah, he became, didn't hit me, didn't hit me. He stood up. And 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 like, it's like fucking hell, John. What you fucking mean? And all this kind of stuff. And, and it was all that kind of stuff coming towards me, then going back, and coming towards me, and going back. And I just stood my ground. But I can tell you now, when I'm scared, my little toe shakes. <laughs> and it was both of them were shaking. <laughs> yeah, honestly, that was in all the things I've done, and I've been scared a few times. Um, it's probably because you know what he's capable of. Yeah. 100%, Do you know what I mean? You know, you don't give a fuck. And if he'd got hold of me, I'm not saying he would have killed me straight away, though he probably could have killed me straight away, but he would have done me serious damage before the boys came in. But I wanted to, but I, I was quite good though. I managed to stand there, kind of emotionless and just like, you know, I just stood there and he, he'd already been charged with attempted murder. And this, this was about perverting the, he tried to, he tried to pay off um, a couple of witnesses. And, um, but I was, and my toes didn't shake until I got home. I, even when I went home four or five hours later, my, my, my little toes were still shaking. Now, again, people don't get that in the police. You know, they don't get that, you know. And all cops, if you've done 30, 40 years, you're going to have moments in your life where you are scared shitless. And um, there is no understanding or acceptance of, of the kind of, of that, you know, part of your life. Oh, it's just part and parcel of being a cop. No, it's not. But but you have to deal with it. Yeah, you know, back in my day, no counselling, nothing. You know, you just had to crack on. Yeah, and I feel like it's one of those situations, isn't it, where people often say, like, in, in bad situations, you've either got to laugh or cry. Yeah, yeah. And it's almost yeah. like that. Sometimes that banter and that 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 way that you behave is is kind of just to laugh and and get through it. Do, do you know what, Paul? When I was on the murder squad, and we had. Uh, honestly, we, we, we were inundated with jobs, not, never enough time, never enough resources, so on and so forth. I only did an attachment for a short while um, between ranks. And um, I remember the boss, um, he was a lovely guy, great guy. The counselling would be on a Friday night, you'd go into his office, so all the DSs and DIs would go in there, a bottle of whiskey would come out, and he'd make, you know, in his way, he'd make sure that you're okay, but it really wasn't. And... Um, and I hated whiskey, so I always sat next to the plant plot. And honestly, for about a year, all I did, every time anyone looked at me, I just, I chucked the drink into the plant. They were like, bloody hell, John, you're a good drinker. And, I was, and I, they thought I was a hardened drinker. And you come in on the Monday and the whole office would be stinking of whiskey. But every Friday, he'd come in and he would talk, you know, you right, guys? You right, guys? And that was it. That was the closest I ever got to counselling. Mm. Did it work? No. And I used to like, I used to like, oh, fuck, how could I fucking spend an hour every Friday fucking yapping? So... So was that because there wasn't a provision of counselling or you just didn't want it? No, there wasn't a provision. So as we, so as I left, uh, and I remember doing it, um, so the last few years it came in and then um, you have to bear with me because I'm sure things have changed. But, but, but certainly in the Met, if officers are dealt with a dead body or dealt with a, um, an issue that um, could affect them, then there was mandatory counselling. So everybody would have to... So I remember doing it once for a murder where a young kid got murdered in Hounslow. So I sent the team, it was a uniform team that got there first, and I made sure that they all went to counselling. Couldn't make them go back again, but they would have to go at least once, and then it was a decision for them. But I made sure I spoke to their skipper who was in charge of the team and said, right, make sure everyone goes. And on the Monday or Tuesday, two weeks later, I got them back in to make sure that they'd all, they'd all gone to counselling. So it was definitely coming in as I left. Yeah, no, fair one. So you talked a little bit about how hard you worked and the fact that you kind of went for the ranks pretty quickly. Um, were you a married man at the time? Yeah, so... Family um, man? Yeah, yeah. So, what impact did that have on your Yeah, so family? I got married really young, kids really young, four, four daughters who are now all adults. Yeah, a big, a big, 
a really, really kind of challenging time because the jobs that I did, I couldn't come home after eight hours. So, you know, eight to four, I couldn't come up at four o'clock, you know, if there was an outstanding suspect, if there was a missing kid or we needed, uh, you know, some evidence to, to arrest some, uh, so to charge somebody, the clock is ticking. We're, we're only allowed 24 hours before an extension. We've got three hours to go. We quite haven't met the threshold from the CPS. So we're, we're trying to find additional statements or additional witnesses or this kind of thing. So, you know, um, I would routinely work massively long hours uh, and depending on some jobs, you know, I would, I, 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 I'm not talking about my travels around the world, but for example, you know, uh, the bombings in London um, on, on 7-Eleven. So because it all started off um, in the way that it did, I was in internal affairs at the time, I got sent up to help out and literally four or five days later, I'm set up town. So my own boss was, you, you, he had a, so when you get to a particular rank, I can't remember what it was, but it might have been chief inspector, you had a job credit card and he was buying me clean underpants and socks and shirts every day, <laughs> put me up in a hotel. And literally all, all I was doing, I was facilitating statements and, and significant witnesses. And I just stayed up town for four or five days. There was no question of me coming home. I couldn't come home. You know, we had 30, 40, 50 people dead. So did your wife just accept that type of thing at the time? Was she fine nah, with it? No, I mean, nah, not, I mean, to start with, yeah. I mean, and but but the reality, the truth of the matter is, as as... Uh, so obviously I'm divorced now and I'm married again, but towards the end, we, we, we basically, uh, it's not entirely the job's fault, but I do blame the job. But eventually we just, we, we kind of just became friends because I was never at home. You know, I remember a bit fun of the Falklands story. I remember in the Falklands and like a lot of jobs, what happens is you get there and then you realise it's far worse. <laughs> it's, it's, it's worse than you thought. So for example, I went to the Falklands, meant to be there one week, I ended up being there three weeks. So at the end of the second or third week, I remember a couple of my kids crying on the phone. Where are you, Dad? Where are you, Dad? We want you back, Dad. You know, I'm 8,000 miles away. There's only two flights a week out of um, out of the Falklands. And um, I'm stuck on an island. My kid's crying because they haven't seen me for two or three weeks. You know? So these, again, these are the things that you have to deal with mm. as you go on. And eventually, um, it 100% was part of the reason why it cost me my marriage. Because I just wasn't at home and, and, and sued my first wife. We just separated and we became, it was platonic, we became friends. Mm. And in the end, when I retired, um, you know, I'd already, we'd already separated at that stage. And I came obviously from Plymouth and I came back to Plymouth. Yeah, it must have been so hard, mate, like with the kids down the phone. Yeah. Being away, that, being away. And we, we talked earlier about obviously the challenges that you've kind of got outside of that sort of stuff anyway. Yeah. It must have been really, really fucking hard. Yeah, it is. It's incredibly does, does, hard. Would that ever impact your like judgment? And and I guess you must, especially as a detective in, in some capacity, you must have to really kind of like have your eye on the fucking ball. Yeah. And you're, you're overworked. You've maybe been out for days. You've got your kids yeah. crying down the phone. I, I remember many times, um, weirdly funny, uh, phoning Sue and saying, like, sorry, love, I'm going to be late. Uh, and I wasn't a drinker. You know, and, 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 and you know, been faithfully married almost. So I was only ever late because I was at work dealing with work, and um, you know, and she would go because obviously four children, so she's at home stuck with his kids. You know, can you get some milk? Oh, can you get this? Can you get that? You know, we've run out of bread or whatever. And I'm like, fucking hell! You know, I've got this. I've got this outstanding suspect. I've got my cops desperately to get home. I'm trying to f empower and motivate my team, and um, I've got the bosses screaming at me. I've got the Lord Mayor asking what the hell's going on. They want to do a television interview, and I've got the missus. Where's your milk? We haven't got any bread. You know what I mean? And it's funny, it's that that throws me more than anything else, you know? Yeah. Shit, there's no bread or milk at home for the kids, you know? Because um, I know for well, you know, four children and I had three under five and four under six. And um, and that threw me more than anything else. And like, I'm, so I'm at work now, I think, oh, shit, you know, I should be thinking of this or, you know, we've got outstanding suspect or whatever it is that I'm trying to think of. And, um, you know, my wife is... Is, is saying, can I get the milk and bread? And the reality is, I'm I'm at home for the. I'll, I'll be home 12, 16, 18 hours later. Yeah. With um, and and this probably wasn't a thing. I, I certainly think don't 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 think it was a thing back when you were probably referencing. But obviously, the European Work Time Directive now. Yeah, yeah um, it was. It came in. Yeah. Okay, so so. I, I, I think with that, you can kind of sign away your rights yeah. to that. Is that what you had to do yeah. as part of the job? So so if I remember right, Paul, and it's a long time, so you were allowed to work 48 hours on average over a three-month period. Obviously, as I became, obviously, a senior leader, obviously, it was more, obviously, European Working Time Director became more and more apparent. The reality is, I don't know why they allowed it into the police. Ridiculous. 
you know, to, to restrict COPs to 48 hours. So what happened in the Met is departments or individuals could opt out. So obviously, you know, um, I, I would routinely do at least 60 hours a week. So is it salary based or is it just overtime? You'd yeah. So when I was a detect, when I was a constable sergeant rank, it was overtime. And when I became a substantive DI and above it's salaried. But I guess if you're, if you're on like a case, cause obviously it's not just the amount of hours you can work in a week. It's also like the amount of hours in a row, yeah. the rest between shifts. So I think it's 11 hours between right. finishing and yeah, starting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how, like if you're a detective and you're on a case, yeah, like I, I guess it's just it's impossible, isn't it, yeah. to, to go right, guys? I'm I'm off now for eleven hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, good I luck. Mean, so, so the biggest challenge I had was that. So when I was um, head of safeguarding, obviously a majority of the cops were female, yeah. really brilliant, hardworking individuals, um, and so we had so so safeguarding was domestic abuse, rape. Uh, and child abuse. And so, so when you said that most of the, the officers were female, you mean yeah. within that team? The within within team. the safeguarding, right, the safeguarding world, right. just the way that it was, um, um, a, a majority of the staff were yeah. female. Yeah. Of course, a majority of the staff were female, but also the primary carers of their own children. All right. So it was difficult at times, you know, when you had a job that came in and you knew it was going to be long hours. The reality is a lot of these women, uh, and rightly so, 100% rightly so, had to go home and look after the kids. So, you know, I'm trying to juggle resources all the time. Um, and, and one of the hardest things I found um, in the job was was at times was trying... So I struggled to start with because I policed a certain way. Me, John Kennedy, I policed a certain way. I expected everybody to do what I did. I, it never dawned on me that people had their own lives, their own issues... Um, I just thought, do you know what, got to do the job, the, the job comes first, and everybody pleases the way that John Kennedy wants to police it. So <laughs> initially, I found it really difficult when people say, oh, wait a minute, boss, can't do that, because I've got this. Boss, can't do that. You know, well, why can't you? You know, what do you mean you can't stay for another four or five hours? You know, um, you know, and I get things like sports day. Sports day, for, for even for me, really important, right? Even sports day or nativity play, really important. All right, but to start with, I didn't get that, so I, I was a bit of a tyrant to start with, and this is all the put, 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 you know this is all part of learning as one evolves into a leader. And I, look, I was a good leader and I was a bad leader, you know. And at times I was good, at times I was bad. I'm not saying I was perfect in any way, but um, you're trying to convince these cops to stay on and, and do A, B, C, and D, but they've got their own lives, they've got their own issues, uh, which are more important to them than me trying to get the job done. So you, you're balancing this all the time. And um, God, it was really, really difficult, really, really difficult at times. And I, I especially on a Friday, right? So a job comes in on a Friday and people have got the weekends planned, childcare sorted out. Something comes in at three, four o'clock, might be a murder. And then basically no one's going home until the following day. You try and find 10, because the way that a murder works, you have different assignments, family liaison officer, exhibits officer, so on. So you need a team. To, to kind of do the job properly. And um, at times it was really, really challenging. Mm. Really, really challenging. Yeah, because everybody has their own, everyone's got their own lives, haven't they? Yeah. And not everybody puts the job first. And you shouldn't really put the job first. You know, your own life has to come first. Then somewhere down the line, the job comes first. But when I first started, for me, the job was everything. You know? Yeah. We, we call it job pissed. That's the expression we, we, we call in the Met. I'm sure it might be the same elsewhere. And, and to start with, I was massively job pissed. But as I got older, wiser, realised actually there's more important things in the job. And just to clarify, that's nothing to do with pissing initiations, right? No. Okay, fine. <laughs> no. If anyone did that, I would not be happy. Yeah, okay. What was the uh, the highest profile case that you worked on or the highest profile people you worked with? So, I mean, it's, it's difficult. Um, so, I, I, you know, I did several jobs, which, I, listen, when, it, when back in the day, when you dealt with a murder or you dealt with a rape, it was always front page news. But... Um, but but I, I did jobs where um, homeless secretaries got actively involved. So I would I've done jobs where I've had to brief Theresa May when she was Home Secretary, Jack Straw, Boris Johnson when he was Lord Mayor. Did a lot of work with Sadiq Khan towards the end. Um, so so um, you know there's plenty of you know plenty of murders and rapes that I dealt with that were front page news. I've been, been interviewed on Sky, been interviewed on ITV, BBC. Um, obviously. 
as you go higher up, you get media training. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, so you know, you know more or less what you're going to say. Do they do they do they tell you pretty much what to say? No. So what happens is you've got a department with the Met, which is media. So they they organise everything through the press. So like, right, got to be in this room, and then you have all your television cameras here and bits and pieces. Or you might do a one to one interview, but you yourself decide what to say. But it's structured. Yeah. So, and it, so you go down a particular path. It's the same. If you look at all these pieces, yeah. it's the same it's structure. Just, yeah, it's a structure. Yeah. And I think it's. Um, I know I've done media training before, and it's it's. Yeah. Um, it's more around kind of how to be evasive and how to watch out for traps yeah. and like when to go right, not, you know, I can't comment, yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's yeah, more yeah. navigating that, I think, isn't it? It's funny. So what was I watching yesterday where, so we've got, um, it's the, it's a double murder. Is it in Cambridge? The double murder in Cambridge that happened oh, the day before it. yesterday. And the, the chief superintendent was being interviewed and basically every question was, don't know, don't know, don't know, don't know, don't know. He never actually asked. As bad as the crooks, question. aren't they? No comment. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> no, but it's because they can't like commit to anything. Because yeah. if they commit to something and they're slightly wrong, they're fucking chucked yeah. to the wolves and yeah. everyone calls them a cunt. And, and also, <laughs> guys, you've got to understand before someone is charged, you know, you've got to be careful because things could be used or against, That's you know. Yeah. So, so again, I was very nervous about saying anything uh, pre charged. But once someone is charged and going to court, you can open up yeah. a little bit more. And also, you've got to be very wary of the victim, you know, the next of kin. They must come first. First and everything that you do so uh, it's you know you speak to them find out what they're happy so so you know it, everything is different um yeah. but um yeah, yeah it, it's just part and parcel of the job um so so quite quite a lot of mps you you kind of have dealings with just listening to kind of what you've been saying throughout and yeah. your style of working and yeah. communication i imagine you might have fallen out with one or two yeah 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 100 percent. and um and but obviously you know these are seen you know i can't show my um, disagreement or my disgust or my, uh, I mean, Jack Straw um, never authorised a single surveillance authority um, and Theresa May was was very difficult, but they had their own agendas. I had my agenda and um, I'll tell you who was really good was Boris Johnson when he was Lord Mayor. Absolutely, really, really. And I, I'm not, by the way, not defending him, the party gate or anything like that. <laughs> Rest of us were struggling. He should have been doing it as well. But when he was Lord Mayor, he was really pro police, really, really pro police. And I think actually, when you look at his um, what he did, I'm, I'm, I'm all I'm talking about is crime, nothing else, because uh, you talk about politics, it gets very divisive. But he was really good, um, and and every time we approached for something, he would always support us, 100. percent And yet other MPs were a nightmare. Yeah, okay. or the Home Secretaries were a nightmare. What do you mean? Why, why do you keep saying Home Secretaries a nightmare? Is there one particular or no, no, no? Just so, so I, I um, ended up. Uh, so Jack Straw was Home Secretary under um, Blair, and and um, and Theresa May was Home Secretary under David Cameron. So um, Home Secretary ultimately is the boss of the police. So for certain things, we need their permission. So I would go up to them um, seeking certain permissions, and they would either give it or not give it. And Jack Straw and Theresa May just wouldn't give stuff. Sure yeah, wouldn't give it. okay. Um, so what, what what impact would that have on your ability to do your job though find another way what just loopholes no 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 loopholes no um, <laughs> of course not Danny no loopholes no um, you have to be creative yeah yeah so you have to think on your feet and be creative in anything that you do the problem is if you go outside the law or outside police and criminal elements which is the bible police and criminal elements 1984 that's our bible if you go outside that you may get a short win you may get an arrest you may get a charge but it will come unstuck and the case gets thrown out at a later date on appeal and that comes back to you it comes back to me yeah uh, not not necessarily so that, that's happened a few times right for various different reasons but i guess primarily someone potentially who's guilty gets away with it as a result 100 percent. and also you've got to explain to the victim and yeah. the victim's family now i've 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 um been very creative in the past i was known for it and um and <laughs> and most of the times you know maybe i got away with it but the, the reality is if, you, if, if it doesn't um it comes. You're not going to lose my job over it, but the reality is, uh, somebody gets free, um, and then more importantly, you have to then update the victim and explain to them why the job wasn't done properly in the first place, which is really, really difficult. It must be so fucking hard if they've like quite blatantly done a, a crime. Yeah, and the, and it's you know bang to rights, and then just because 
the police are fucked up or you know yeah. the, it must be that must be so, some shitty conversation so back in the day when when, when we recognized domestic violence for the first time you know a lot of women were getting abused and treated shabbily which by the way is still happening today we haven't we've not got anywhere near sorting out domestic violence community safety units were set up to deal with domestic violence this would have been the late 90s um, again, I was picked from Hounslow to lead. Uh, when I say lead, I was the DC in charge of the team. There was a DS in charge of me. But I was I was um, in charge of the team that dealt with domestic violence when it first came in. And we decided the Met to do a zero tolerance approach to domestic violence. So, so of course, it was brand new. All right, It's not like it is now. So basically, because it was a zero tolerance approach, if we had the smallest bit of evidence, we were going to arrest and charge. So I would obviously stretch that a little bit. So so if there was any allegation of domestic violence, um, I would arrest. I would do everything I can to charge them and then they would go to court the next day. Obviously, 90% of the time they would plead not guilty because obviously they the wife still loved them. They still loved the wife. The kids were involved. You know, it's not as difficult yeah. as, 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 as it seems, domestic violence. I think that's why we struggle with domestic violence. There's always reasons why well there's people that stay in domestic violent relationships for years yeah yeah 100 you know whether it's because of the kids they got no anyway we, we yeah. talk all day about that anyway i remember going so i was Isworth crown court was our was our court and the resident judge was judge cochran and he would routinely say to me um when i went up he said ah do you see kennedy are we actually are you actually going to give me any evidence today because half the time i didn't have the evidence so the case would be thrown out you know but you're stuck in limbo, aren't you? You're trying to protect these women, even if it's just to give them a 24 hour respite. Um, and, and, or you're trying to stretch the boundaries of what is acceptable or not. To be fair to the judge, he totally got it. And, and we had a kind of mutual respect. Every time I turned up at court, he would smile at me because he knew I probably didn't have a lot of evidence. Obviously, things have evolved now. Um, yeah, no, fair one. So, uh, so we've heard lots about. Some of the shit stories are scary stories. Yeah. I want to lighten the mood a little bit just, yeah. just as we kind of get near in the end. There's got to be some funny shit. Yeah, there is. Like, you must have embarrassed yourself. You must have seen some funny stuff. Like, tell us, tell us all. Well, yeah, um, I'll tell you one. I, I particularly find this a really funny story. So, when I, so I was in internal affairs. And um, so, when I came back, I had to come back to Hounslow for a short while. Uh, so I, I passed my promotion to um, to chief inspector, and the way the job worked, you had to go back to uniform for a period of time. Um, so I ended up back at Hounslow. I did about three tours at Hounslow. So I ended up back as chief inspector, and because I'd been on internal affairs complaints, any complaint that came in, the boss would go, "John, sort it out," thinking that I was the expert at dealing with complaints. But thanks, boss, because all complaints are weary. So one particular day, I had a complaint from it comes straight in uh via the home office so it was, it was quite contentious and what it was was um two traffic cops on the a40 in west london were doing a speed um, they were out processing cars for they had a, a, a camera gun mm -hmm. but if you know west london the a40 is adjacent to RAF northolt which is the queen's flight so the queen doesn't fly into heathrow like the mps she's got the, the royal family have got their own place where they fly and it's RAF Northolt. So these two traffic cops got really bored one day and uh, they heard the I heard a plane come in and they pointed the camera up and this plane was doing like doing 250 miles an hour or two on, on the radar gun. They go, oh bloody hell, it's doing 250 miles an hour. Let's see if it gets up to 300. Um, anyway, so they kept it going and, and actually it was coming into land um, and it decreased and decreased. They didn't think anything of it did their tour of duty, went home. Now, what had happened is it was the Queen's flight. Now, on this particular day, it was being escorted by two tornadoes. And what had happened is when they did the radar gun, it had given the impression of a lock-on for a missile onto the Queen's flight. Now, because it's <laughs> oh, the Queen's no. flight, <laughs> yeah, because it's the Queen's flight, they would have been perfectly entitled to locate and shoot, right? 100%. There's a lock-on, mm. right, to the Queen's flight. So somebody is locked no. on with a service to air Fuck missile you, system, no. right? But it wasn't. It was these idiots <laughs> with a radar gun bored trying to get a high speed on the radar gun because they're bored. No Luckily, way. somebody in the control tower, so if you go down the A40, there's a control tower and they've seen the cops put two two together and literally last minute stopped, stopped them doing what? it. Well, they've got to bomb them. They've got to shoot it. Yeah, yeah. They've got to shoot They, they thought it was some me. terrorist with a service to air missile. 
So, um, but you can imagine the fury and the complaint. So they complained. It went all up to the field air marshal. He got hold of the defence secretary. Defence secretary got hold of the home office. Home secretary got hold of the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor got hold of the chief superintendent. Chief superintendent said, John, sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so how did you go about that? Then? Oh, oh, old, old, old school bully, mate. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, them up. I, I got them in. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I got them in, and and it, we, let's just call it a learning experience. <laughs> let's leave it at that. They didn't lose their job, obviously, but it, it was a learning experience. That's just stupidity, though, isn't it? That's like something I would do. do yeah, you know what I mean, I'd I was be thinking like, the oh, same thing. Look at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it would be me. I'd be yeah. sat there and be like, "Fucking look at this poor." Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so another, another, obviously, I'm trying to make sure it, I'm not going to drop myself in it with some of these stories. Come on, so, come on. Oh, mate. So, um, so funny enough, I only talked to this guy yesterday to say, look, I'm not doing this podcast. You're happy for me to share it. So <laughs> when I was a DS, we had a guy working with us. Um, and, you know, we're, we're still really good mates. He's a Plymouth boy, funny enough, uh, Ray. And, but a bit of a... Bit of a um, you can't use the word chubster now, can you, or porker? A bit overweight. Of course you can. Call him a oh, fat fuck if you want to, mate. Like... <laughs> anyway, and a bit away from because he wouldn't stop eating. Right. So he was the kind of guy. <laughs> That's usually out. why, mate. Yeah, exactly. We'd go out, he'd be eating. Go out and arrest somebody, he'd be eating. He never, ever stopped eating. But he was a good lad. And um, I spoke to him a couple of times. I was like, look, mate, it's not really professional. You know, we're out there. Um, <laughs> you know, you're, yeah, that's you're eating your pasta, <laughs> you're eating your sandwiches, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, and that's, you know. And I, Just constant. I, yeah, it's constant, constantly eating. So I told him and told him and told him. So in the end, I thought, right, I'm going to have to fucking sort it out. But, but I didn't, like, think, right, I'm going to set him up. I just thought one day... I'm going to try and have to teach him a lesson. Anyway, so one day we're doing observations on a um, on a disc wall driver. So someone that's been disc wall, we knew that he was driving. We're just sitting up there waiting for him. And out on the radio came, um, and it comes out quite frequently, person not seen for a while, strange smell coming from the house. A lot of people die, especially if they live on their own, until yeah. they start, whatever. So it was literally about 20 metres from us. Now, we don't normally deal with that because we were a crime squad, but I said, but... But I can't help myself. I always like to, to get involved and do stuff. So I went, yeah, um, um, tag my X-ray from, from DS Kennedy. Yeah, that we're just opposite. We'll go and deal with it. No problems at all. So I went round to the address. Ray is eating a huge, I mean, a huge mulberry pork pie. <laughs> so we get out of the car. He's still fucking eating the pork pie. I'm used to it now, so it's not a problem. But I thought, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe. So um, lock on the neighbour's door. Yeah, um, listen, yeah, there's a young lad. So... Um, lives at this address, hasn't been seen for a number of days. The house is a bit pongy. So, right, I said, kick the door in, let's go and have a look. So, Ray kicked the door in, still holding his pork pie, kicks the door in, you can smell it straight away. Oh. Right, so, so, so I'm looking around and it's like, I, I just got this feeling something's not right here. So, we searched downstairs, nothing. Right, come on, Ray, let's come upstairs. <laughs> Anyway, so we go upstairs <laughs> and um, search. I think I think so. This is Carly Road in Uxbridge. So three bedrooms. We search two bedrooms. Nothing. Go into the third bedroom, and the smell now is just overpowering. So we get in there, and obviously Ray hadn't noticed it, but I'd noticed it. So I noticed some blood spots on the wall. So all about I'm starting to think crime scene. Yeah, but obviously we haven't found the body yet. So um, the bed's dishevelled again. There's more blood spots on the bed, but nothing. I'm not saying anything to Ray yet. I'm saying that Ray, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, there is a cupboard in the bed, and I'm thinking, fuck is in the cupboard. So some type of murder, some type of incident, and he's in there. But the smell is overpowering. Ray has still got his fucking pork pie in. So what, I'm, even with the smell? Even with the smell. He's still eating. He's chomping away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still fucking eating. Still the, do you know what you, you say? That's fucking weird. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, but do you know what? Weird. It might be nerves as well. Sometimes I, I've seen cops eat and it's a nervous right. thing. They just feel... Anyway, okay. so I thought, right, I'll fucking... All right, I'm going to fucking teach. All of a sudden, I've got a plan formulating in my head. So what, I stood dead back. body? <laughs> so I stood back. Sorry, I'm waiting for the... I stood back. Take Ray, video, it's kick that door in. I said, kick that door in. Said, yeah, why should I do it? I said, look. I said, kick the door in. We need to find out if the body's there. So th this time I'd, so this time I'd step back and um, I'm by the door, literally about two or three metres away and um, and Ray's by this cupboard. So Ray gives it a big with his, with his boots. The door kicks in and I'm not joking. He is covered in maggots, flies. Obviously they've got the pork pie as well. 
screaming out the room, followed by a waft of flies, his pork pie, which he's still got, is covered now in maggots, screaming down the stairs. I'm there laughing my socks off. So it being a murder, obviously, it was a it murder. It was a murder. It was a murder, and matey boy had been put in, into this cupboard. Um, but Ray was literally just covered in head to toe in maggots and flies. And that was my little, and from that moment on, that was the end of his pork pies. Fucking hell, John. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was yeah, but that, pissing myself. That sounds that sounds unbelievable. That you yeah. want to go and you know the smell, and then you know you you, you you in your head you must be thinking this is a this is a murder you know, or whatever. And he's still chomping on a fucking pork pie. Still chomping on the pork pie. Like you said, mate. Maybe maybe it was he needs nuts. to watch. Yeah. He needs to listen to our podcast with the cardiologist, yeah. mate. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell. If I spoke to, I only spoke to him yesterday. He lives in Bainstoke now. I spoke to him yesterday. So look, mate. I'm going to tell you the story about you and the pork pie and the dead body. And he said, yeah, fine, just go for it. So, probably, so he'll watch this and he'll have his socks off. And from that moment onwards, um, there was no more pork pies, no more pasties, no more sandwiches. He got it. Probably saved his life, mate. Who knows? Was he still a big boy? No, he's not. Oh, no, he's not. See it? See no, it, he, he said, tough, you, you got any love. others? You got any others? He retired a few years before me. Let me have a little look on my little notes. Um, so do you want me to drop a few? So another interesting story, I got called out to a posh house in Kensington and um, some koi carp, really expensive koi carp had been stolen from the pond and it was Mary Austin. It was an original girlfriend of Freddie Mercury, Freddie Mercury's house. Right, okay. So it was his house and his koi carp had um, been stolen. She was brilliant. Gave me two tickets to watch Queen live. That was another <laughs> job. I then went to report a theft in a block of flats and knocked on the door and uh, Carly Minogue. So Carly Minogue came and she'd um, had her handbags stolen. So that was interesting. What's she um, like in real life? I tell you, she was lovely. Yeah? Yeah, lovely. Is she? Yeah. Small, isn't she? This was going back to you. Going back yeah, 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 that's what I mean. This in her A-Day yeah, as well, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I still think she's a good-looking lady now. She's not. Um, I've really, really seen her. Sort of the, uh, the Eden project. Actually. So I got a phone call yeah. once um, <laughs> from the boss saying, um, saying, John, we've got somebody's coming in tomorrow to, to um, he's been arrested um, abroad. He's coming in on a, on a, on a flight um, and he's going to be taken to Chiswick Police Station. Can you, sh can you please make sure um, he's looked after? There's going to be a massive amount of press interest. And it was Ronnie Biggs, great train robber. Oh, yeah. So that was another one of mine. So I had to look after him for a couple of days. Strange individual. but um, <laughs> um, Strange individual. So, yeah. So back in the day, talking about um, bits and pieces. So, but, you know, I said to you about the camaraderie in the police. So one of the things that we did, I mean, you wouldn't do it now so much. Is it unprofessional? I don't know. But we used to play jokes I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll tell you whether it is, all right? I'll Go tell on. you. <laughs> so, so I was obviously a bit of a lad. I used to like playing the jokes and trying to be the big, big I am. So they were always trying to get me. They were always trying to get me. And after the time, they failed. So one day, I'm in my car. Uh, I'm, I'm based at Ricep now in northwest London. I'm in my car. Go out, go out for a drive. And um, I'm just driving. Change gear. Sorry. I change gear. And then I get this stench like I've never ever even worse than the dead bodies and the little bass is a taped a stink bomb when the old fashioned stink bombs yeah. to the break things <laughs> the break, <laughs> and it exploded <laughs> and I had to spend the whole shift they honestly. fucking stink they, as well they, have you ever spent yeah, yeah. it was awful it, absolutely awful little bastards oh that's good so that is I got, back, I got them back for that right um, what else have we oh, got two here sides, it's got two sides well, I mean, this yeah. is just stuff so, I mean, to be honest we've, we've mentioned a lot of this already Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what. So, interesting story. So, when I was a DCI, right, so to work leadership. So, I always led from the front. It's the way I was, always led from the front. And um, one of my little nicknames was the Horn. I always liked to get involved and find out what everybody was doing. And I was a nightmare as well because beginning of every shift, I'd walk around the offices, morning, how are you doing, especially on a Monday, how was your weekend been? And I realised after a while, the last thing they wanted was the boss walking around because they was obviously either drinking, you know, just chilling. And of course, every time they saw me, they pretend to be working front and, I, you know, it didn't bother me. Anyway, one day I got some information about a Colombian drug dealer um, importing a massive amount of drugs. Uh, again, this is, this is an address in Chiswick, funnily enough. And um, he had previous as well. So it was, it was really good intel done four or five years previously as well so intel was spot on but he had one of these doors with a metal frame at this, you know it's a typical drug dealer's door so anyway we got the job sorted out i got one of my trusted um 
skippers who was level two public order we got 20 officers all kitted up got an out of court warrants so we got the warrant to kick in i even got we called them ghostbusters the guys with the special door opening equipment so they're they called ghostbusters so the not police officers a civilian team so we got them involved and um and i've decided i'm going to go along for the crack you know i, I quite enjoy it get out of the office i'm in my armani suit blah 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 you know all dressed up you know um, no, and every, everybody else is in their right gear, protective <laughs> gear, but you know, that's just where I am. So anyway, so, um, about three or four o'clock in the morning, we slowly creep up. It's, it's like a first or second floor flat. So we slowly creep up. I can't help myself. And looking back now, I think, John, why do you do it? But anyway, so I'm at the head of this, I'm at the head of this level two kind of door opening team. Ghostbusters go in, and as they start going, and obviously they, they, they're on a kind of pneumatic drill, there's a noise. Next thing, matey boys at the front door, he's got a loaded crossbow, <laughs> shoots it at me, it just misses me, literally, on the head. The door goes in, the boys go in, and obviously remind this man what to do. I, I'm, I'm having to drag these boys off him, because right, they're obviously giving him a little bit of justice. And I'm having to drag him off, because all I want him to do, I need him talking, rather than, than going off the hospital. And um, but it just reminded me that sometimes leading from the front is not a wise thing to do. So um, yeah, that was that was um, that was an interesting evening. Did uh, were there any other situations where you were part of a door opening team? Yeah, I know the job you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> right. So <laughs> what is so that's no, fine. I've told Paul this story before. So back in the day, do you ever remember a documentary program called Cops? Bad boys, bad, bad boys, boys, what you're going to do, gonna do, what they're going to do yeah. when they come for you, right? So it was an American documentary. I used to love it. So anyway, they came over to the UK literally for one week. Obviously, they they, went, they came to the Met and they wanted to witness um, a drugs warrant. So just coincidentally, it was a team that I was on. We, had a, um, we were doing a crack factory in Wimbledon. Now, because I was quite a fit lad, big lad, I could run and everything, I was what's called the key man. So I was the door opener. With the enforcer, you seen the big enforcers, yeah, yeah, yeah. big, that, big yeah. red things. But because this was rushed through for the documentary, we hadn't really planned or recorded it. So normally, when we do the job ourselves, we'd record the address, have a look at the door, uh, lifestyle of yeah, the yeah. occupant, so on and so forth. But we hadn't done any of that because we're doing it for this program. So because it's a TV documentary, we had senior officers from the TSG, like chief superintendents. We had about four or five camera crews, everything. So again, two or three o'clock in the morning, and we're creeping in. <laughs> now the problem is this door was a, a, a tall door, a little bit of glass, and the lock was three quarters of the way up on the door. Now, normally with an enforcer, you swing up to the lock, but there's no way I could do it. So I had to hold up here and come down on it. Right. So I'm obviously the lead man, and there's about 20 cops behind me. I've got five camera crews videoing me. I've got the chief watching me. I've got everybody watching me. But I was like, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'll do it. So like, so creep up, creep up, creep up, get faster, faster, faster. I try and do the door, I miss the door. It goes through the glass plate window. <laughs> Obviously, with my hand the other side, I don't drop the enforcer. I've got all the guys <laughs> fucking into me. <laughs> Obviously, straight away, I'm thinking, oh my fucking word, they're going to take the piss now. I'm not worried about anything else. Drugs getting pushed down the loo or anything else. Back, 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 back. <laughs> Pull the enforcer up, which took about a minute, because they're like, I'm literally like that. Pull the enforcer up. Obviously, I'm really angry now. Bang the door, do it the door on the first time, go in, and we, we do, we do it. <laughs> I, can't, I, can only, I can only tell you, obviously, what happened over the next couple of days. Yeah, just got rinsed, yeah. yeah. Did, you, uh, did you ever see the episode? Didn't go out. <laughs> didn't go out. <laughs> it didn't go out because of that. It didn't go out, no, it didn't go out. No. They, just, so, they just went uh, home and went, no, that fucking no, Met, because, please. Because they, they, would have seek, they would have to seek permission, and there's no way the Met would allow that. <laughs> we, we look like a bunch <laughs> of cowboys. That's fucking you know. class. Oh mate, that's funny. So there you go. That was that was the end of me doing the door for a while because normally you have little periods, and if you do the door on the first time, you stay being the key man. So after that, I, I can't even remember the next time I I did the door. <laughs> I was <just> bad <laughs> doing it. Oh good, oh, mate. We've been going a while. Any anything you want to kind of just finish up with, whether it's advice to people, uh, story, or anything? Do you know what? The only thing I will say is this, and I know. Um, Paul, you, you, you've had a few people in. Look, I, I've, I've got four kids and I wouldn't have a problem with any of them joining the police. Um, it's a great career. Um, there's massive amounts you can do in the police. I'm so proud of any cop 
that is out there doing their job. It's incredibly difficult. Everyone thinks the bad things of cops. Every time you see it on the press, the bad things. But please remember, there's millions of good things that cops do every day. Um, resources are really tight. They do a great job in difficult situations. Um, it's a great career. Um, but just be mindful, there's two sides to every story. Mm. Yeah, definitely right. Yeah. Thanks, DCI John Kennedy. Thank you, Thanks, sir. Mate. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, John. Cheers, Dan. Thank you, mate.